Yeah. All right, so we're here with uh, Bentley Evans, the one and only. What's up? Man, uh, (laughs) writer and director of Martin, creator of the Jamie Foxx show, uh, creator of Love That Girl, writer, director of Love That Girl, creator of Family Time, In the Cut, uh, showrunner on Dad Stop Embarrassing Me with Jamie Foxx. Damn. So many, so such an illustrious career. Long credits. Where does it, where does the, where does the career begin? Man, uh... You know, it's what's crazy when you when you throw the numbers out there, it sounds crazy because it's been 30, 35 years. Wow. Congratulations. 35. 35 years I've been in the business. 35 years. And I've never done well, I've tried to do other things. Um, I don't know what else to do other than uh entertainment. Real estate, I like the idea of it, and I try to, you know, a little bit and I almost lost my shirt. But um, <laughs> but um it goes, you know, goes back 35 years. Uh, to uh, acting, I, I started out as an actor. Never wanted to be an actor. Was never interested in it. It was, it was fun. So, so think about it like this: if you, if you think about um, being like eighteen, nineteen years old, right? And we think we know a lot at that age, but we really don't know nothing at that age. And you're thinking about becoming an actor, but you've never done that before. You don't know anybody that really does it. So it becomes a thing where it becomes a hobby as opposed to a career. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I wanted to do it because it was fun. It was just a fun idea of, oh, I can get popular real quick, chicks, mm-hmm. the whole nine yards, right? Mm-hmm. But I never looked at it as a career. I never even looked at the possibility of that. I'll do this forever. It was like, oh, I'll just get into some acting, get on, you know, it, you know, do some walk-ons on a TV sure. show. Mm-hmm. But then once you get, once I got in there, and I started meeting serious people that really took it serious. It was really funny to me at first. Like, you really take this serious? <laughs> I'm a thespian. <laughs> and it was really funny to me at first. But then I was like, yo, this, this could be a career. Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, one of my partners, this dude named Tommy Morgan, he's a character, real, real character in my neighborhood. He was the king of bagging on people. He could make anybody laugh. Nice. And he was the one that introduced me to it. He said, hey, man, we should be actors. I said, do you hear that? That sounds so corny for somebody to say, <laughs> Listen to hey, yourself. Be actors. <laughs> I was like, that sounds crazy, right? He's like, man, we could do it. And so, um, you know, he, he, knew, uh, he knew Robert Townsend. He had just met Robert Townsend. And Townsend was doing Hollywood Shuffle at the time. And so uh, he was like, man, let me just go over to Townsend's house. And, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know how the etiquette. We just drove over his crib. He lived in an apartment off Wilshire and Crenshaw. And we went over his crib and knocked on the door, and Townsend opens up the door, and he's like, yeah? yeah like, <laughs> Tommy's like, remember me? It's Tommy. He's like, okay. And he's like, and uh, I brought my boy with me, Bentley. He, he want to get into he want to get into the acting, too. And Robert was like, hmm, All right. okay. Well, right now is probably not a good time. You guys should call first. Yeah. I'm just getting out the shower. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're serious about you know, doing it, uh, I'm shooting something starting tomorrow. I'll be here at six o'clock in the morning, and don't come empty-handed. Mm. Like, what, what the heck does that mean, <laughs> right? And in my mind, I'm at a I'm at a junior college. I'm at Santa Monica College. I went on the the, the junior college tour. Mm-hmm. I went to Santa Monica, <laughs> West LA. I went to Trade <laughs> Tech. What's the other one that's up on Vermont? Uh, can't think of that one. LACC. LACC. Yeah. I tried it all, man. And so. I'm like, well, I gotta be in class in the morning. Tommy's like, man, fuck class, man. <laughs> we, we can be, man, this could be, you know. Tomorrow, we're actors. Right. 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 We could be right. actors. <laughs> so I got, uh, I went and got me some donuts uh, the next morning, got some, uh, you know, 15 bucks from mom's, got some donuts, showed up at Townsend's house, you know, and I thought it was gonna be like, hey, man, I'm here. Dude, he was like so rude at the time because they, you know, they, they packing up bands and stuff. He's like, yeah, 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 put the donuts over there, grab, grab that. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So I'm just grabbing stuff and I don't even know what none of this means. I don't know nothing about show business whatsoever. And so I go, the fir- I remember the first, uh, the first set we went to was on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard uh, and Melrose, something like that, somewhere right in there. It was a post office. And Robert does this thing in Hollywood Shuffle. He's like, there's always work at the post office. That was like the big message in the movie. And they were shooting that scene first. And when I walked on the set, I swear to you, it was like it hit me in my face so hard. Like, this is magic. This is where you should be. 
And I was like, this is what I got to do for the rest of my life. Somehow. I don't know how it's going to work out. So he hands me a script. He says, go read that from cover to cover. I had never read a script. Didn't know anything about it. And as I'm reading, I'm busting up laughing at these sketches and all this stuff. And so I said, man, who wrote this? Uh, he was like, I wrote it. And I was like, oh, man, that's, that's what I want to do. He was like, he just laughed at me. It was like, yeah, well, right now, get your ass over there. <laughs> yeah, pick up, don't pick up over there. <laughs> <laughs> don't throw the trash out. And so, so you know, it was, just a, it was just a funny experience on how that whole thing worked out. And then um, I, I literally dropped out of school the next day. Oh, wow. I dropped out. I said, I'm not going back. And scared? Too young to be scared. I mean, you know, like, in other words, it was like, I didn't know what life was about yet. And so, I, you know what I was scared of? My, my, my mother's reaction. <laughs> That's what I was scared of. What's my mom's reaction gonna be? Is that a Kleenex over there? Uh, I'll pay her down, nothing? No, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, I mean, if you gotta go. No, no, it should be. I'm, I'm cool. Uh, unless you tell me I got snot bubbles or something. <laughs> I, got, I got snot bubbles, y'all. You know, let me know if I got some friends and shit. Yeah, but um, yeah, no. So, but I was scared of what my mother would, you know, what her reaction was gonna be. My pops, yeah, I didn't really care because I know my pops is kind of like, he kind of free spirit type of guy. Like, hey, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah, figure yeah. it out. Get some money. Yeah. Figure it out. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my mother, I knew she'd flip. So I didn't even tell her. I was just going. To, I was acting like I was going to school, but instead I was going mm. to Townsend's house and and working on editing and and you know going to the set and stuff like that. We didn't have no permits. You know, we was out in the middle of the street shooting, and he would give you a walkie-talkie and go, "If you see the police coming, you know, <laughs> oh, you, look out. <laughs> you know, look out." So you'd be right, right. I'm on the corner of LeBre and Pico. Here come the black and whites, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But it was like learning, seeing it was seeing it from an independent standpoint, right. and. It was so amazing to watch this dude put this thing together and how he financed it on his credit cards and he took a chance and he was bold with it. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, that was my introduction to it. So that's what I know. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, once you're in there, you start meeting everybody. You know, I met Keenan Ivory Wayans on that project. Keenan was probably 20, 28 years old. I'm, I'm 18 or something like that. And, um, I met Damon Wayans, John Witherspoon, uh, all these uh, got Paul Mooney, all these cats that would become, you know, big names, uh, Tommy Davidson, uh, so many of them. But we were all just in the grind together, you know. And um, I met Cuba Gooding Jr. You mentioned his name a little while ago. I met him during that period. And so we didn't really know what was really going on, but they would always say, man, you got to get an agent. Right. And I was like, well, for what? Well, man, you, you know, you in SAG now. So, so part of the, you know, the, the reward for working on Hollywood Shuffle for free was Robert <laughs> was like, look, I can't really pay you, but I'm going to get you in the Screen Actors Guild, which SAG was a big deal at that time. Mm -hmm. So I got in SAG and then I got, uh, there was this dude named Desmond. He's uh, Trent's brother, uh, Desmond Gums. And he had this agency and he was the only black agent in Hollywood at the time that had wow. his own agency called the matrix a agency and there was a there was a guy that worked in the that was in the agency as well he was an actor too and so desmond didn't have a lot of money so sometimes the actors would come in and volunteer to answer the phones <laughs> and i used to volunteer to answer the phones and stuff like that it was this white cat in there uh named bradley who used to answer the phones as well and, you know we'd all be in there together and this guy bradley is now his name is brad pitt Oh, oh that's okay. real. That's yeah. real talk. That's wow. real talk. Damn, that's real wow. talk. That's Bradley. That's, 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 Brad, Bradley, that's, real, that's real talk. It's like this. Oh, Brad, Brad, Brad made it, right? Yeah. But it was that, it was it was just at that time. It was real exciting, and you had to go from um, you had to go get a bunch of black and white pictures made, and then you take them and you walk walk into these agencies and see if, if anybody will take you. And it was like you'd wait for weeks for them to get back. There was no GPS, right. none of that. So you had a Thomas guide. I literally learned LA mm -hmm. by auditioning. That's how I learned the city. Cause you had to figure out how to get from over there to the valley. Yeah. And then what is the valley? Okay, what is Ventura Boulevard? Okay, now let's figure that out. You had to really figure it out at that time. And so that's, that's how I, you know, how I got into uh, the business and got into, it was all through the acting thing and then then I got the acting bug when I started booking stuff. Mm. So for me, it was nobody that really fit my 
uh, my criteria in the, in the business because, you know, baby face, six foot two at the time, mm -hmm. you know, probably 165 pounds. So, of course, I was going up for all the basketball player roles yeah. and had no ball skills whatsoever, <laughs> but, but I was lying and all that kind of stuff. And so I started booking stuff. I started booking these roles and stuff like that. And then, you know, once you start booking roles then you start meeting other people mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the you know, you have these pinnacle people mm -hmm. that are that are very instrumental in your in your career. And, uh, you know, Robert being one, Keenan being another. Uh, the next piece was uh, Martin Lawrence. I meet Martin Lawrence at NBC. We're both up for the same role. Now, how is that? I'm five foot. <laughs> I mean, he's five foot seven. I'm six foot three. And we're up for the same role. And um, so the way they used to do it back in those days, you would have to screen test. And so um, we were at NBC all day. You sign a contract and you sit there all day mm -hmm. with all the other cast members and stuff like the potential cast members. And so, you know, Martin was cocky, you know, little man, you know, big attitude. And he was cocky and he was like, hey, man, you know, I'm going to get this role. Man. I'm just letting you know that. Oh, but, this is in the, in the yeah. like when y'all hanging out. Yeah, we <laughs> hanging out. We go to Taco Bell. Yeah. Martin's like, yo, man, let's go to Taco Bell because they gave us a lunch break. He was sucking you out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know I got this one right. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's cool. You never know. He goes, no, no, I know. I, I got this. <laughs> I got this. But tell you what, you know, let's exchange numbers and everything. You know, I don't know nobody out here. He was from uh, Maryland. And so... He was right. He, he, booked he, he, booked, <laughs> <laughs> he booked the role. It was a show called Little Bit Strange. It was like, you guys remember the Monsters? Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. it was like a new version of the Monsters, right? And so he gets the role, and he called me and told me. He said, hey, man, look, I got that role, man, but um, what you doing next week? Let's go to the Clippers game. I got a boy that plays for the Clippers, Charles Smith. I said, cool. So I went with him, and we pretty much sealed a friendship from there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we started hanging. We was hanging like... Every week I was bringing him to the house for Thanksgiving and stuff because he didn't right. have no family out right. here. And I became part of his family. So, uh, you know, a, a year or two into it, you know, they started talking about uh, developing a TV show around him. And I was like, man, I ain't going to develop no TV show around you. He was like, yeah, they talking about, you know, I got some ideas and everything. I want to see what you got, you know, what you want to do. You want to uh, you want to be one of these actors on this show? And I was like, nah, man. If you want to do something for me, and this is just, it's like, these, these are the turning points. It just right, happened. Right. I said, now you want smart conversations, man. We're just rolling. I said, man, what about writing for the show? And he started laughing. He said, yeah, but you, you don't write. And I was like, yeah, no, I know how to write some stuff. He was like, nah, man, that's what the white boys do, his exact words. And I was like, <laughs> nah, man, I can write a script. So I had, you know, I, you know, I, I used to sit around and write the scripts. I'd be watching Cosby Show, and I go, man, they should have did it like this. I'm gonna write it how I would have wrote it, yeah. you know, just on notebook paper. Mm -hmm. And so uh, um, I had my mother type all these scripts up. She had never, she was like, what is? That? I don't know what no damn script is. <laughs> I'm like, just write it like this. Just type it like this. Mm -hmm. So she typed them up for me, and, and he was doing House Party Two at the time. Wow. And um, I took a stack of scripts over to Martin while he was shooting. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't write, huh? Mm -hmm. Take a read at these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he called me the next day. He was like, man, I apologize. I didn't know, dude. <laughs> I didn't even he know, He said, so bro. whatever I do, you got to be a, you got my voice. Mm -hmm. You got to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, man, definitely. So, you know, I want to be on the writing staff. So he went to his management people and said, your dude got to be with me. Mm -hmm. He got to be with me no matter what. He's part of my team. So check this out. So. The first meeting we had was on the Fox lot, the 20th mm -hmm. Century Fox lot. Uh, I had been on the lot as an actor before, but never saw it like this. We go up into the big corporate offices and stuff. And, you know, sometimes you just meet somebody in your life that's so different from you. Right. But then you go, this dude is special. He's something else. Right. And Martin was something else. He was, he was a guy that uh, was really, really instrumental in, in my life and he was uh he's only a year older than me but he was like a real big brother mm -hmm. take charge type of guy confident cocky the whole nine yards and so we go to this meeting and so the receptionist says okay martin they're waiting for you in the in the office he said come on man come on so we start walking in and the receptionist says no 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 your friend can stay here uh they're waiting for you so I said, oh, okay, cool, cool. I'll just, I'll just sit down. And Martin said, nah, 
the hell are you talking about? If we going into the meeting. Mm. If I'm going in there, he's going in there. So I was like, oh, okay, what part of the game is this? So I'm, I'm just rolling with it. I'm watching him. And so the president of HBO, uh, Chris Albrecht, he's there. He comes to the door. Martin, what's going on? We're waiting for you. He goes, yeah, my boy's coming in the meeting with me. And they were like, no, nah, he's not going to come in to me. He's going to stay. That's what Martin said. Well, if he don't come in, I don't come in. I'm like, what? You're stuck in the back. Like, Martin, not for me, man. Not for me. <laughs> what <laughs> does this mean? <laughs> so we go in the meeting. All these people were in there. John Bowden, Bowman, who actually created Martin, he's in there. And so Martin walks in and says, yeah, this is my dude. This is the writer. I'm, he's, he's writing my show. And they were like, nah, that doesn't work like that, Martin. So then they, it became a clown session. They were like this, oh, yeah? So what have you written before? I was like, well, uh, you know, Ken is looking at some sketches for a little color. Uh -huh. They were like this. Mm, yeah, okay. Right. Mm. All right. Martin, anyway, this is John Bowman. <laughs> he went to Harvard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, so it, was, it was like a real clown show, but I was like watching Martin. And he, never, he was not laughing. He was real serious. And it was like, yeah, we might do that. I don't know. He was like real serious. And I'm going, yo, who is this dude? So on the way out, I learned a valuable lesson. We're walking to the car. He ain't saying nothing. He's just rolling. He got a scowl on his face. So I say, hey, hey, Martin, check this out, man. Uh, hey, man, I appreciate that, man, but you don't, man, don't, don't, uh, don't fuck your shit up trying yeah. to look out for me. I, I appreciate that. And, and, and I got the reaction that I never thought I would get. He turned around and he said, look, I'm looking out for you, motherfucker. He said, don't ever say no shit like that to me. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what, what? <laughs> he goes, he goes, I'm going out on a limb for you, man. He said, so, you know, if you're going to be weak, I can't have weak people around me. So, facts. so he, I mean, facts. Yeah. And he was like, so, so, you know, when I, when I go, with, you roll with me on that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And it was a lonely ride home because he didn't talk the whole <laughs> ride home. And he was, he was angry, but he, I didn't know why he was mad at me. But he was like, yo, man, don't. Don't be saying no shit like that. This is this is what they do. Yeah. So if I'm bringing you in, don't question it. Just roll with it. Go to battle. And I learned I learned that lesson right there and everything. So then, you know, about three weeks later, I got the phone call and they were like, "So we got some good news and some bad news." I was like, "I'll take the bad news first. And they were like, "Well, the bad news is you will not be writing uh, the show for Martin. That's not going to happen. But if the show happens, you'll be on the writing staff." Okay. That's awesome. That's great news. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, so of course I called Martin and told him, he was like, all right, were well, you cool with that? I'm like, yeah, man, absolutely. So then I start, I got, uh, the, the show gets picked up after we shoot the pilot in the whole nine yards and my, uh, my theatrical agent calls me up and she says, I got a role for you on Doogie Howser. Wow. So I said, okay, I went in, I auditioned, I get the role, I do Doogie Howser. We, in the first week of, of shooting Martin. So I called, you know, the exec producer and told him, hey, man, look, I'm going to be a little late today. I'm doing this role, but I'll be there by 11 o'clock. So when I get there, <laughs> Martin comes walking into, uh, <laughs> walking into my office. I'm going, who is it? He turned into a different person. He said, where was you at? I said, oh, man, I, booked, I did this Doogie House shit. It was cool, man. The dude's cool, man. It was real cool. And he was, He's blank facing me and he goes, you got to make a decision. You want to do that? Because if you want to do that, that's cool. But if you want to do this, you got to be here. And that day, that day I quit. I called my agent mm -hmm. and I said, I'm no longer an actor. <laughs> and I remember she cried. She was begging me, why would you do this to me? And you could have came to me to do your deal. I was like, you're not a, you're not a literary yeah, agent, you're a theatrical yeah. agent. <laughs> and, uh, and I quit. I quit, and um, and then from that point on, I became a writer on the show, and I was like, damn, am I making a mistake here, or should I take this ride? And I think, for me, I think I took the right, made the right decision because I really wanted to be behind the scenes, and I never really had the confidence. I could never see myself as Denzel. Right. I could never see myself as a serious yeah. actor. Right. So, but I love being behind the scenes, man, where you can create and uh, you know you can you can work with people, give opportunities, and it's like being the puppeteer mm -hmm. as opposed to the puppet. Right. Yeah. So I I, I dug that. Man. So jumping in, taking those chances, not being afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you were afraid, but you were still able to take the leap and say, you know what, I'm I'm not going to school anymore. I'm doing this, or I'm not doing Doogie Howser. I'm gonna make sure I do this. How did you shift your mindset to like go all in on the 
being the puppeteer instead of the puppet? Well, so so for me, it's it's like uh, the mindset changed for two reasons. Number one, when I when I when I became well, when I became a writer on the show, um, I started talking to the different execs and talking to the different people that were in the room, and they started talking to me about the money, mm-hmm. and. I was like, what, what, what? Yeah. what I was money. like, yeah. yo, that's NBA player money. Yeah. In my yeah. Yeah. Not, not at my level, but their levels. Right. And I was like, you mean so you can get to that? Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah it's no, no problem. I mean, shit, you know, I'm here. They're, they're paying me seventeen thousand per episode. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? you know, this this is ninety two. You that's know, what I'm saying? Smith doing that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So I was like, this is this is crazy. You know, it's crazy money. So. And then I realized, you know, it was like you start meeting these writers and you start realizing, hey, the writers actually control the business. The actors are somewhat secondary. Absolutely. You see what I'm saying? And the respect level that the writers got as opposed to the actors, mm-hmm. it was like, yo, I like that. I like that. So it, it, it was a thing where I was like, I, I'd rather be in, in the, in the, uh, included in the, uh, the creative process because now you're, you know, you're in the castings mm-hmm. and you're, you're watching the business and you can learn the business. Actors don't know business. They right. don't know the show business. Yeah, they right. just know the acting business. They know the auditioning process, right. but they don't know show business. And I learned that along the way that nobody that's in front of the camera understands show business. Right. They're just a part of the, they're just the product. Mm-hmm. They're, they're part of the product. They're entertaining. Yeah. They're, they're entertaining. Yeah. You know, they, yeah, that's it. And so that was what made me really focus all my attention into that. Mm -hmm. That's what made me say, this is what I'm going to do uh, full time. I gotta do this. And so it was was a a respect factor. And then I realized I didn't, I didn't want to be famous. I would rather be important than to be famous. Mm -hmm. 100%, wow. Um, Because I saw the, I saw the way that overnight, I literally watched Martin go from hey that go that's the dude from uh, from a house party to oh my god it's Mark I watched it right and I saw how it affected him and mm-hmm. I was like oh I don't, I don't, I don't know if I want that right. mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'd love to have some respect and some clout <laughs> on the street but I don't want that right you can't even eat a meal without somebody up in your face and you don't know if somebody is around you for you or mm-hmm. or for your success you know so. You know that, that's what that's what made me make the uh, the switch. Much sweeter on the other side. Yeah. So, get that so for, I mean, you talk about the writers and people going to Harvard and being, you know, study trained writers. How did they receive you? Right. You know, how were you received as, you know, being a, it's the '90s. You're a black dude in entertainment. A rookie, a rookie. And, and, yeah, and, 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 did the city and you were you were the guy that was brought in by the lead. That was like. Okay, I got to bring my boy, too. It wasn't cool, I can tell you that, but it was almost like I had to get their trust because you're going into this writer's room situation. So the writer's room is similar to what we're, you know, where where, where we are right now, a little bit bigger of a table and more people at the table. Mm -hmm. And you got a stenographer there taking notes and everybody's got their little micro mini recorders and you're recording the sessions. And so, you know, it's like the first day of school, you show up and you're like, you try to do with the person next to you. Hey, now what do we do here? Yeah, yeah. You're asking questions. I mean, literally, because it's no instructions. Right. Yeah. Nobody gives you nothing. They just show up. So you show up and you're like, should I sit a certain way? And you know, so, so I, should I dress a certain way? You know, you, you just don't know. Right. And so, you know, you get in there and you just kind of follow suit. And then you're looking at these, these people and they're afraid to be themselves in front of you because they know you're Martin's boy. Yeah. So I had to get to the point where it was like, Hey, look, you guys can, you guys can talk, talk about the actors. I'm, like, right. I'm not gonna go tell them. Right. And it was almost like, nah, we can't trust oh, so it. They, they didn't know if he was in there, actually spy. trying you to do spy. it. Or, yeah, you, right. And, and my thing was, because I mean, look, in writers' rooms, we talk a lot of shit about the actors. Like, yeah. real, I mean, a lot. <laughs> Man. Sure. That's that's the that's the show. Yeah, that's the show. Yeah, it's the yeah, it's it's show. And so. Uh, <laughs> You know, once I gained their trust after being there for about four or five weeks, uh, they realized that I was, you know, truly in there to be a writer. And then there were, you know, there were a couple of writers. There was this this group, uh, Billy and Jane, they were a, a team and they were a writing team and they, they did 
plays, Broadway plays. Mm-hmm. They had worked with uh, Lucille Ball. I was like, damn, how old are y'all? Y'all worked with, work with Lucy? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and so, but they knew television writing right. so well. And so I appreciated them because what, what Billy would do is say, hey, let me talk to you in the office for a second. So you go in there at lunchtime. Hey, what's up, Billy? And he would go like this. Hey, you know everything's not about a joke, right? You're going, what? Yeah, you just keep throwing out jokes. And I'm like, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, but what about the structure, dude? You can't just throw out lewd jokes. Mm-hmm. Let me show you structure. So, I, you know, it's like you got some people to kind of mentor you. Right. And they would go. And so in the room, they would say, hey, Billy, what do you think? And, and test you. And mm-hmm. you go, well, I think that if you take Martin and Gina, and then, you know, I started speaking the language a little mm-hmm. bit. And they were like, mm-hmm. okay, now he's starting to get it, mm-hmm. you know. Then I started getting phone calls in the middle of the night going, hey, man, I'm trying to finish this group. What do you think Martin would say? In this particular instance, I'm like, oh, now I'm a value. Right. Because value, yeah. number one, it was two cats in there that were, uh, I think we started, I was 24, and, and I think Benny was 25. And Benny had come from Fresh Prince. Mm-hmm. And so he, he had the same hookup. He got in through Will. Right. He came mm-hmm. from Philly with him. And so uh, they, we were the two cats in there with cross color, cross colors on and backwards hats right. and stuff like that. So we were the two guys that got Martin's voice. So they always came to us for references. You know, like they would say like, what do you say, hi, G's? No, no, he would say, what's up, G? Right. Oh, I don't know the difference. <laughs> of that. You know, thank you for that. Thank right you, now. thank you. you know, so you kind of keep him on, on track, you know. Like he's not gonna say couch. Man, he's, I mean, he's not gonna say sofa, he's gonna say couch. Right. Right. I mean, you know, I'm sitting right. on the couch. He ain't gonna say I'm sitting on the sofa. So <laughs> he's not gonna say that, you know. <laughs> and that kind of stuff, you know. So you had to kind of, you know, keep him honest to our voice. Mm-hmm. And so then you become, you know, you become uh, a part of the, the of the of the sound of that room. And then when the scripts start coming in, and Martin's pissed off, he's looking at me. He's like, "Why you let that come through here?" And I'm like, "Well, I ain't got the power. I can't override them." He's like, "This, yes, you do." So then you're like, "Oh, so now you're in the room going, he ain't gonna say that." Yeah. He won't do that because you don't get your ass chewed out. Right. So you're like, "Nah, change that, change that." And then they start listening, and it became harmonious. Uh, the networks didn't always like it because uh, the studios and the networks, they would have a, a idea of what they wanted. You know, they hated the characters. Right. They hated Shanene. Oh, they hated yes. Romy Rome and because they sure, didn't. They didn't know those characters. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. We know Shanene. Yeah. We we all got Shanene in our family. Mm-hmm. We all got that one yeah. cousin that's you know I'm I'm on that Hennessy. You know we <laughs> we, I mean, we just know her yeah. right. and we know Romy Rome. We know these characters that are in in our in our society. And so there's no way they can write that. Right. Ain't no way in the right way you can write a. a so you know some cats that, that Ivy League cats could write something for a a, a player, right. you know a player yeah, that's stuck you know from the seventies and he's got a perm and he's wearing a, a MCM suit. You know <laughs> oh, they don't know what that is. Man. You know it's, it's not possible. Yeah, you're right. So um, it just you know we were doing something a little bit different. So that was the experience of getting in there and getting the respect uh, from them. But at first you know like I said you you would, you would say stuff like you would hear them, you know they would say hey you know what. I have an epiphany, and I'd be like this in my mind. What's what the fuck is that? So you couldn't wait to get to your office. There wasn't no Google, so you're looking in a dictionary. Ah, epiphany. Mm. So you go back in the room. You know, I was having an epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> so you start trying to, you know, speak the language a little bit, and then, and then you kind of find your own voice where you go, okay, I don't have to be that. Be yourself. Mm-hmm. Either they like you for who you are, what you contribute, or they don't. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know that was that was the hardest the hardest part. Was that the the number one lesson you kind of took away from those early kind of days writing in your career? Was like finding your voice and finding like what made you you as a writer versus being other people? Yeah, that was the hardest part because you know it's like you know you still toy with it all these years later. You still you still go, who am I? Am I am I adapting to somebody else? Am I trying to be Tarantino? Am I trying to whatever? Who who am I? Mm -hmm. And so you just have to be honest with the conversations that you have with yourself, and uh, you know about your voice and what you think and what you believe, and really find you know what you believe. Just because everybody else is is a Democrat. Right. It's okay if you want to be a Republican. You right. don't have to do it just because that's what they do. For sure. You know what I'm saying? For sure, yeah. It doesn't matter uh, because of your skin color. What you? It doesn't matter. Be what you are. Right. And try to be as honest as you can. And that's 
that's the that that is the hardest part. That's still the challenge of, mm-hmm. of always finding your voice because the voice changes because um, you get to a certain age, you don't speak like that anymore, right, or right, you're right. not ex- you know the same experiences. I mean, it's just a minute ago you guys was in the club. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Y'all not in, I mean, y'all not in the club now. You know, you guys is changing diapers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's a because it's a, it, because it's progression. Mm-hmm. So now. Ronald Bentley, they're like the the youngsters that are bringing that new that new voice into the the lexicon. Mm-hmm. Uh, my daughter's writing, so she's bringing a new perspective mm-hmm. on it. So it's, it, you know, everything changes, and you kind of have to stay current with the times too. Right. You gotta. I still listen to rap music. I'm I like I I'm going on record here saying that the the new rap music is absolutely awful, but. Also, all of it or just parts of it? And I Drake, think Drake is the real deal. Okay. You got to check that J. Cole album out. J. Cole, one. yeah. Is he good? Oh, that's right. Really, he's telling J. Cole story. is not yeah. good. Yes, yes, yes. I look, the, the, the babies and the oh, babies. No, no, and no, no, the, no. I, I can't get with it. I'm trying. I don't yeah. want to sound like the old man in the room, but I try. Yeah. And I'm going, it doesn't appeal to me. And I'm going to say something blasphemous for you guys because I know you guys like this dude. But I don't even get Kendrick. Uh, no. I don't get him. Dang. I don't get it. Kendrick. Dang. I don't get it, Dang. but I love Drake. Right. Yeah. Drake is the truth. He's the greatest in the game. He's he's saying something. He took what Jay-Z and Pac and Biggie and all that, he took it and he literally took it to the next generation. Right. And he's still doing it to where it's connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know with, what I'm saying? With, with your generation? With our with generation. Our, yeah. With my generation and for everybody, I think that's the, the separating factor, even as, as a writer or somebody who's creating, for you to be able to connect with different generations. So is that the tough part that you're talking about, still trying to develop those things and go through today? Yeah, because you know, I don't know if what I think is funny mm-hmm. is funny anymore. Yeah. In other words, I still think it's funny I come from the era where insults were the greatest comedy of all. Right. Sarcasm, comedy comes from sarcasm, yeah. in my opinion, yeah. right? But now you gotta be super sensitive because you don't wanna offend a certain group of people. Yeah. And which it used, to be, it used to be fun, you know? Uh, uh, I did this funny character on Martin, you know? I played the gay character on Martin, and it was funny because we were, you know, we were going in. Yeah. And you know, and it was like, I'm trying to do anything to make Martin laugh on screen. Right. And I mean, whatever it takes, right? But now you can't do that anymore because, you know, they, they take offense to that, man. And, 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 the, and the, uh, the censors, you know, they're like, oh, no, no, we're not. The world's a more think, sensitive place. Yeah. It's a more sensitive place, man. And you're like, how did the world become sensitive? I would have thought that it would have become. You, well, you think that's easy? Yeah. You, you yeah. think that's good overall? Or is that kind of, I feel like that's a bad thing for creativity in general to have to limit because of someone being insulted or something right like there was the whole Chappelle thing when he came out with the special and they tried to say that it was bad and it was a zero percent and then they opened it up and it was 99 percent on Rotten Tomatoes right and it was mostly because he was talking that shit that Chappelle talks right because he can do it uh, he, right. he can get away with doing it mm-hmm. if I do it I'm canceled right. mm-hmm. you see what I'm saying mm-hmm. um Maybe, you know, Martin can get away with doing it still, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think Jamie can. And here's the reason I, I say that because, like, so Jamie Foxx is, he's a Oscar winning actor, mm-hmm. and they look at him a little different. Although he's a comic, mm-hmm. they want him to be a little more responsible because right. he's an actor. Right. So, right? He's got he's a, a certain th- stamp on his name as opposed at- to another voice that's a little more free. Mm hmm. Yeah. Is, mm-hmm. it, is that the is that the different the difference like uh, comics get to kind of do what they want to do and say what they want to say in a way and yeah. if you're an actor you don't you have to kind of be in those confines in a way yeah you got a license as a comic mm-hmm. to basically uh, strip down all the sensitivity right. uh, sectors and just basically come in and say what you want and be honest and brutally honest. Mm-hmm. And those that like it, like it. I mean, Paul Mooney mm-hmm. was as brutal as I love they, Paul Mooney. He was yeah. as brutal as they came. I used to <laughs> love to watch him. And he had no, no problem uh, offending mm-hmm. white people, mm-hmm. black mm-hmm. people, everybody. Every, yeah. But Don yeah. Rickles, yeah. same thing mm-hmm. yeah. on that side. And uh, you guys remember Don Rickles? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. No, I don't. Bro, let me tell you. Don Rickles <laughs> was probably, when I was growing up, he was the funniest person alive. Even And that's in a Richard Pryor era and, wow. era and everything. Wow. But Rickles, uh, he ran with, like, you know, what, Frank Sinatra and wow. all these guys. But he was a like, rap pack. But, yeah, he was, he was in that. 
and he talked about every group he didn't care. He talked about black people. <laughs> he talked about everybody. He would make jokes, and I had to, the, the experience of being insulted by him one time. <laughs> and pleasure. I thought it was, it was a pleasure. <laughs> For me, it was a pleasure. Yeah. And, and, and he called me a coon, and it was so funny. But, <laughs> but there, was on, there was only one black other black person present, oh. a guy named Kyle Bowser. And Kyle was staring, and he looked at me, and he said, he said don't laugh at that shit. That's not funny. I was like, hey, Kyle, that's pretty fucking funny. Because it was the way he did it, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And then he gave me a hug and kissed me on my cheek and stuff. So it was like, you know, it was all in jest. Yeah. So I could deal with that. Mm -hmm. I could, I, I, I'm not a sensitive. You could take the roast. Man, I could take the roast. I grew up, Dude, that everybody, was the thing, right? hey, look, yeah. man, my neighborhood, if you couldn't handle getting getting bagged on on the street, yeah. hey, man, go on in the house, man, because yeah. you come outside, they're getting you. Humility is a beautiful nobody thing. Was, nobody was immune to to a joke or, you know, getting roasted or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you became really uh, good with that stuff. So, nah, that was, it was just it was just a time, but Rickles was great, man. He, if, if you ever get a chance to go look at those old roasts and stuff, oh, man, he have you on your back laughing. That's, yeah, man. So when does? Oh, I got a uh, just quick question. Going back to like, um, you know, your first staff writing um, opportunity and stuff. As much as obviously it was a blessing for yourself to be a part of the staff, do you feel like you were a blessing towards the staff being able to to be that voice for Martin and being in there to kind of give them that that you know that image of like, hey, us as brothers, we don't we don't say that. You guys gotta, yeah. You know, we gotta tweak it a little bit. Yeah, I do. I feel now, um, of course, after the fact. Uh, so when I started, no, I didn't know that I was a factor. I knew that every now and then I would throw in something because I was like, oh, they don't know those Ice Cube lyrics. Yeah, I could throw in that right. that that you know that joke <laughs> in there, like where Martin would say something like. Yo, uh, like, what'd you do last night? Man, I was in there with Gina. I knocked the boots from here to Albuquerque, <laughs> right? And they don't know. That comes right out of an Ice Cube yeah, song, right? right? Yeah. And I'm like this. Oh, like, they don't Billy, know. you're a genius. Oh, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but so, so then as you're going along, you start, to, you start to understand who you are in the room, and you're going, oh, I am very important to this. Mm -hmm. And then going back, when I look back at the show, I look back at the episodes, and every single episode, I could see my stamp on it. Even if I didn't wow. write that particular episode, mm -hmm. I'm like, that was my idea. I told him this. This happened to me in real life. Right. This, and, and, and using uh, my relationship in real life, uh, me and Val had got together right around the time when the show was uh, taken off, right? Wow. So I would go into the writer's room and tell stories about what happened with me and Val and they would go, yo, we got to do that storyline with Martin and Gina. So me and Val became Martin and Gina. So most of those storylines, I would say about 70% of those storylines are me and Val. Oh, wow. That's, that's we amazing. both know. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's amazing. Right. Oh, I remember that. Right. <laughs> whether, 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 whether Martin admits it or not. Right. And I don't, I've never had a conversation with him, but that's exactly what it is. The, the, uh, John Bowman, who created the show, he, mm -hmm. he would most definitely... <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, attest to that mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. because you know the high school reunion. I was like, "This man, let me tell you what happened in my reunion." I went back in my bins, right. <laughs> and I was like, "This check, <laughs> check." You know, like, "Oh, what are you doing now?" Okay, yeah. Got you. Yeah. You, know, like, you know, so so telling that story, I was like, "We gotta do Martin going to the high school reunion." You know yeah. what I'm saying? And I went back by myself, just like he did in the show, because Val was having a Trouble pregnancy, so she couldn't go. Mm -hmm. I went solo, just oh, like yeah. I had Martin go solo on the show. Nice. You know, how you go in there and clown and the, the guy who thought he was the coolest guy in the school. So that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you started real, realizing the, uh, the relevance of who you are in that room. And I know when I watched that show, it's like, damn, that was a huge hit. And people still talk about it. And there's shirts mm -hmm. and there's this and there's that. And I'm going, those are my stories. Yeah. The, the world don't know that that's based upon... They Me threw, and my wife. They threw all the Laker players on Martin characters last night after the loss for a parody. Oh, they? And they used it and did a parody with them and Martin walking in the room. It was hilarious. Yeah, I mean, you know, all that get to stepping. I took that straight from my mother because she used to say that. Well, you better get to stepping. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like this. Get to stepping. You know, all that kind of stuff. You start hearing different things. Uh... Uh, Martin used to always say, you know, we was in there ear hustling. I, I heard that in a liquor store one time when I was working in my friend's father's liquor store. And then my brother used to throw all kinds of gems at me, you know, 
uh, uh, junk in the trunk. Mike, he said that to me. I laughed so hard. He said, you know, he said, damn, man, man what, what, what's her name? And I told him, he said, well, it must be something in the water they're drinking because she sure got a lot of junk in her trunk. And I was like this. <laughs> Write that down. Yeah. And this dude named Ken Ken that lived in my neighborhood, he, he was the first person I ever heard say, come on, man, come on, man, I'm one of the original players from the Himalayas. And I was like, mm, need that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, wow. you, so you just start taking what you hear around you and you go, Oh, the world's never heard that. We might he heard it in our neighborhood, right. yeah. but they ain't heard it outside of our community. And so those are the things that I learned how to go, oh, let's take our experiences because the world's going to think that they're great. They, mm -hmm. they never said, you go, girl. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that was you know, stuff that we said you right. know, and all that. Now you see them on, see it on Friends. You, you go, girl. Yeah. 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 You stole yeah. That. How was that at the time, seeing kind of, I, I guess, the, the, the flair that you brought to your show and seeing it like repurposed on other shows yeah. and becoming like a culturally relevant thing, right? Did you guys know at the time too yeah, while you're you doing recognize? it in the room? Like, yeah. did you know like, oh, this is this is special? Oh, you mean as far as what we were doing? Yeah, no, I, like, don't, I don't know if we knew it was special then, but when you saw mm -hmm. uh, you saw it on another show right. or on a commercial, and you start you start going, oh, this is a part of the American fabric now. The right. the, the, the conversation. Then you started to know that it was special, mm -hmm. and it was like you were doing something that nobody else was doing. Um, so you know, you 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 kind of got mad at it, but mm -hmm. then you would go, uh, uh, imitation is the best form of flattery. All right. Yeah. So, okay, they're flattering us mm -hmm. and, and doing that, but are they going to give us the credit? Right. right. They ain't going to give you the credit. <laughs> so you recognized kind of internally and personally when you were important. When did, on the other side, they acknowledge you and you get start getting promoted or you start getting different positions or uh, moving up the ranks? When did they take note and say, okay, this guy, he's important, we need him? Well, the, I think the most important thing that happened to me in the first year of Martin, and it was an unfair advantage. We were, uh, we were going to Chicago, and Martin was doing stand-up. And so I had to miss a Monday in the writer's room, right? So I told them, you know, I'm going with Martin on the road, and Monday I'm not going to be in the room. So John was like, cool, no problem, I'll see you on Tuesday, right? And so the next week he was going to Kansas City, and he wanted me to do the same thing. And I was like, hey, man, I can't miss two Mondays in a row. You know, I got to be in that writer's room. So Martin got all mad and shit. And he was like, what? I said, nigga, they can't fire you. Can't nobody fire you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you could do what you want to do. So I was like this, ooh, I'm unfireable? <laughs> and I knew that, but I still didn't go. Mm, yeah. I still didn't go to Kansas City because I didn't want them in the room to turn against me and be like, yo, he's just Martin's boy. I wanted them to see me as a viable part of what was happening. Yeah. And so I didn't go, but, um, but I knew that, uh, I knew that uh, he couldn't fire me, so I knew that I had a certain level of power um, you know, going through the whole thing. And then you asked me something else, what did you ask me? When did they acknowledge oh. and potentially promote yeah. you? Or so what happened was, so it's like, when you're on a writing staff, it's just like school, there's grades. So you start out as a staff writer, uh, if you're lucky enough, because sometimes they want to bring you in as a trainee, and that's like kindergarten. So then you start, you come in as a staff writer. The next year you're story editor. Then the next year, next year you're executive story editor. Then you go to sometimes uh, executive consultant. Then the next level is co-producer, producer, then supervising producer. And then co-exec producer, and then exec producer. So it's like grades. Yeah, wow. So every year you just expect to go up a grade. Mm -hmm. So when you have good agents and stuff like that, they negotiate just like you know in your league, and and, and you, you know you guys understand that how how your agents can come in and negotiate more money for you or a different position or whatever. So for me, um, I moved from story editor. No, I moved from staff writer. To, I jumped over story editor and went to story consultant. And um, they were like, it's just more clout. We're going to get, get you more money. And so you roll with what your agents say. And that's where your agents become very important because you're going, and hey, they're taking 10% what they're doing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So, so you start going, how do you know, we're going to just, you just do what you do. We got you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, and I was with CAA, which was at the time, 
you know, that was the biggest. Yeah, that was the shit. Get, can't get shit. higher. Yeah. <laughs> can't get any higher than CAA. We could go to William Morris, and it was a few other ones, but CAA. On, par- on par, parody, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, Mike Ovitz was the, you know, he owned CAA, and he was the, uh, the hot shot of the industry at that time. So, you know, it was just one of those things where you, uh, you know, you went along with what the agent said and everything. So as they start negotiating for you, they start going, hey, well, you know, I think our guy is this and we want to move him up here and we want to skip that level and take him to here. But then when I think they really started to feel it, John Bowman, who created the show, he left to go do a show called Murphy Brown. So he leaves and uh, they needed to bring in a showrunner at that time. So they brought this guy in named Sam Art Williams. Uh, he was a brother, older, older cat. He had did Fresh Prince and some other shows. Mm-hmm. And they brought him in because, first of all, they knew whoever you brought in, they got to be able to stand toe-to-toe with Martin because one thing about Martin, Martin wasn't no punk. Martin right. wasn't scared of nothing right. and nobody. Right. I mean, I've never seen... He's, he's probably the toughest person that I ever met. Mm-hmm. He wasn't scared of nothing, mm-hmm. right? And so they bring in Sam and... Sam comes in the room, and some of the writers respected him, and some were like, who's this guy? We've been here longer than him, but he's above us. Right. And I was always cool with Sam, but Sam didn't have a voice. Mm-hmm. Sam was telling 1970s jokes. Right. Yeah. And we was like, nah, nah Martin, <laughs> Martin wouldn't say that. Oh, well, that's the way it's going to be, so yeah, that's what's going in the script. Uh, and then Martin would read the script. Yo, man, what the, what the fuck is going on, Ben? Yeah. Hey, man, that's what he wanted in there. And then I get chewed out. And I'm like this, hey man, you know what I'm saying? And so after that, uh, HBO, the the company that produced the show, they didn't they didn't they didn't jive with Sam too well. So they needed another showrunner, and they knew that in the room, all the writers knew that I was the guy that was had the most input on all the scripts. Right. So I, I would stop the room and go, no, no, we ain't doing that. Say, I'm sorry, man, I don't mean to disrespect you, but we ain't doing that. He ain't gonna do that. We should have it where he does. So they knew, and it was this one writer, Cheryl Holiday. I never forget, she used to always go, you're running the room, so we just defer to you, because they didn't like Sam. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to fire Sam, but Sam was a brother, and Martin was like, nah, we're not gonna fire him, but what we'll do is I'll just keep him on stage with me and you run the room. So HBO came to me and was like, look, you know, we need you to, are you ready to step up and, and uh, be the showrunner? Uh, well, yeah, you know, but I was terrified. Uh-huh, so I was just like, just emulate what I saw the other guys do, just do it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and just stay honest, stay honest with what your thoughts are. I was like, no, that's not a funny storyline. This would be funny and, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that, you know. So that's when I realized and that's when they started to take note that I was already running the room and once the whispers started getting out to the executives, because the executives would come once a week, uh, they would come and uh, hang out on stage mm-hmm. for run-throughs and stuff like that. And so they knew because they were, you know, the other writers would go, "Well, what is what is Bentley thing?" And they're like, "Well, he's not the showrunner." And they're like, hey, "Not as well, me." <laughs> Pretty much, he's running the room, and Benny had already left. He was above me. Uh, the other brother I was telling you about, because he went back to Fresh Prince. Mm-hmm. And so I was pretty much next in line as far as, uh, you know, uh, brothers. But as far as there were other writers that were above me, but they didn't have a, they didn't have a soul of the show. So mm-hmm. when, I, when they made me the showrunner, I was the youngest, youngest person in the room. And I knew that there was resentment. Mm-hmm. And they was hating on me, right. and I would come in the room and I'd be seeing whispers and shit, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, they all oh, they hating on me, all right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'd just come in and just try to keep the peace, waving mm-hmm. the white flag, hey guys, we in this together. But I make the final decisions on everything, because if Barnes is going to yell at me, I'm taking, I got to have the last word. Yeah, right. And so that's when it, you know, started to shift, and they started to trust me. Was it a big change in responsibility or just more of a title and, and who you kind of referred to? Yeah, it was, it was definitely more responsibility. And here's what I mean by that. Um, once you, so, so once you got the responsibility, now they want you to look at all the wardrobe. You're like, I don't give a fuck what she's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> and they want you to, uh, so where are we eating today? What, what, what do you mean? 
So now you're really running the show. Mm -hmm. They want, hey, Bentley, what, what color do we want the, t the, the covers of the scripts to be? I, I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Uh, Bentley, uh, where should this person's office be? Can you? Oh, I man. don't care. But it was like, but you had to, you know, jump in there. And so now you're, you're instrumental in the furniture on the sets mm -hmm. and you're instrumental. So, that, so now you got to take all the phone calls from the network. And now whenever the writers say you, you're pitching me a story, mm -hmm. now we got to pitch that to the network. Mm -hmm. But I got to do it. Yeah. Right. So I got to take your story and go pitch it because they don't want to talk to you guys. Right? Yeah. They don't want to talk to nobody else. They just want to talk to the one principal. Right. So now I got to go, damn. Man, what did Malcolm say? Jeez. Okay, no, he wants it like this. And then you got to go sell them. And so you might sell, you might take, p pitch 10 shows and they might turn them all down and just go, no, nah, we just like those three. Mm -hmm. You're like, back to the drawing board. Right. You just got three approved. That's it. <laughs> and so, yeah, you become completely responsible for the entire show. And I mean, everything to who's parking in what space. Wow. Uh, Too much, a little kid. It, it's so much, dude. It's, it's like really, really, what time do we eat lunch? Um, everything, every aspect of the show, the showrunner has to make it. Now I could get veto. Martin could come in and go like this. No, we ain't doing none of that shit. Yeah. yeah. And you go, okay, well, you heard him. He said well, he don't want to do that. So, right. but it was, it was rare that he would do that. Jamie would never do that. Mm -hmm. If they told... If I told Jamie, man, we're doing this, he would go, all right, cool, that's what it is. So, um, but Martin knew that I was in a position, but he was ultimately the boss, mm -hmm. but he let me do my thing. Yeah, wow. well, what's that kind of transition like going from being kind of the youngest guy in the room to now you have to be dealing with the network? You're the one uh, having those conversations with kind of what the show is and how it moves forward. Like, is that a... Uh, Nerve-wracking, I'd assume, but like, what's that like? It's intimidating yeah. because you you realize you realize that you know you're you're in your twenties and you got you're telling forty-five-year-old white men what to do, mm -hmm. and they don't like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're looking at them, and you could tell they don't like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I had to check this one dude. He said, "Look, man," he said, "Look, kid." I said, "Hold on, don't kid me. Yeah, yeah. Chill out with all that. Stop right there. <laughs> Hold on, Barry. Let me talk to you in private. Hey, man, don't don't do that. Right. Said, what did I do? I said, "Don't do that, man. Mm -hmm. Don't don't undermine what I'm trying to get done here. I have an idea, and I'm very collaborative. But don't don't disrespect me. That's mm -hmm. not cool. Mm -hmm. And and then me and him became friends. We was cool after that. Mm -hmm. But it was like um, having, you know, that respon that much responsibility was very very intimidating because you're going." Damn! If I, if I, what if I make a mistake? If you start thinking about making the mistakes, right. you're gonna make them. Right. So you just gotta go. I just gotta go on instinct. Right. I don't want to look back. Don't look back. Don't don't think about what if. Just keep going mm -hmm. on all your decisions, and hopefully you're making the right ones. Mm -hmm. Being being, a, you know, twenty. What you were about 25, 26 at the time, or when I became the showrunner. Yeah. Twenty eight. So you were twenty eight. At, at twenty eight, you were basically forced into position to to, you know reach a level of maturity that you had to, you know, condone yourself at. Was that, was that hard? Was that, was that like difficult? You know, you're 20, I'm, I'm 29 now and right. I still kind of look back like, yeah, you know, we, I have a business and everything, but I still kind of look back like, man, I'm still just a kid, you know? And yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was, well, my thing was at, at that time, you know, I started everything early. I got married at 27. Yeah. Right. And so I knew that there was a certain level of responsibility that I had in life. Right. Um, and I think, I think at that time you just thought different, you yeah. know, um, nowadays when I see these 18 and 19 year olds, I'm going, they're babies. We were grown. I was traveling all over the place at 19. I was in Japan at, you know, really young and stuff like that. So it's just a different time. Yeah. But, um, but I, I knew that there was a sense of responsibility that I had and I knew that it was time to put on, big boy pants and mm -hmm. really step up to the game because everybody's watching mm -hmm. and you can't afford to make any mistakes. Right. And they're, everybody's looking for you to make mistakes. Right, they want you to. Yeah, they're, they're waiting and, on it. Yeah, and they're, they're waiting on it, man, and they're poking the bear. And then you also got to learn how to walk to, you know, balance so because you don't want to overstep Martin. Mm -hmm. So we used to have this thing that we used to call, don't beat the stars. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, when the star says something, you would go like this, 
yeah, all right, no, you're right, you're right. And in your mind, you know they're wrong. They don't beat the stars. Uh -huh. If the stars, uh, there's a book, 48 Laws of Power. Yeah. Yep. What's that the number one? Never outshine yep, the master. Never outshine the master. So I was doing that before I even read that book. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Might as well intuitive. Don't outshine him yeah. because he'll go, oh. And I saw him clown writers. Mm. I saw Martin. <laughs> I saw Martin clown. Clown right. He clowned this one dude named Michael. Carrington so bad it was so funny because Michael was new to the show he came on as a writer and he was juggling and he was this kind of quirky kind of guy <laughs> juggling <laughs> yeah, <kind of. laughs> yeah, yeah so we were in the state we were in a uh, we were in a table read and the director says uh, uh, he introduces uh, Michael Michael written by Michael Carrington and Michael Carrington stood up and took a bow. <laughs> thank you, thank you. There's a room full of about 50 people, all the, all the network people, all the writers, everybody. He goes, thank you, thank you, thank you for the great Michael. Martin looked over at me and he said, who the fuck is that? Get out of here. I said, I said oh, that's Michael, he's cool, he, he's, he's a good writer. He goes, oh yeah? So now we go into the table read and we're reading through the script, we get past page three and Martin's energy starts he starts sinking down in his chair and then it's instead of being hey he's here yeah you know Gina you know yeah. so we get to page three Martin says oh hold, hold on hold on stop what's your name man he said Michael Carrington <laughs> Martin took the little brads out of the script and he goes <laughs> This is some bullshit. He <laughs> throws the script up in the air. Pages are flying everywhere, right? They're, they're coming down. Tisha and them are looking like you know, nobody's nobody's looking at him or anything. And he said, you motherfuckers call me when you got a real script. You. He pointed at me. Uh -huh. He said, I need to see you in my office right away. And I was like, oh, God. Here we go again. The show behind the show. So I go in his office. I go to his office. I knock on the door. He said, it's open. <laughs> and I opened up the door and he's sitting at his desk and I started approaching his desk and he just looked at me and started busting up laughing. I said, what was, what was that? He goes, hey man, you better get a hold of your boy. Tell him we don't do no shit like that around here. Right. He goes, I feel sorry for you because you're going to be doing rewrites all night. <laughs> and I was like, man, you cold for that. He goes, hey man, you better tell him. Hmm. We, don't, we don't get down like that around here. Hmm. So I had to go back in the room and say, hey Mike, uh, yeah, that was because so this is how you got to do this, man. You know, you, you don't do that kind of stuff. Because Martin was he, was, he was, he was serious, man. You know, if you mm -hmm. walked in there and didn't speak to him, mm -hmm. oh, it was a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He'd be like this. Hey, man, who's this dude that don't speak? <laughs> what? You know, like, uh, you walk into the room and you don't say hello to me? Right. Oh, get him out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, it was stuff like that. He, he commanded a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. Commanded a lot of respect. Do you, do you like working with, I guess, stars at that level or carry themselves in that way? Or is it like a... Yeah, you know why? Because the one thing that I will say about Martin Lawrence was that he was the most passionate person that I ever met. Right. He was so passionate and you knew he cared. So you knew he wasn't just being an ass. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was like doing that because he wanted to get the, the best out of you. He was like, you know, like 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 Phil Jackson or uh, what's the other guy, Pat, Pat Riley. He wanted to, yeah. yo, I know you got more on you. Yeah. So he just, the way he communicated might have been a little brash. So I was never afraid of that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas working with Jamie was a little more passive because Jamie was like, hey, I don't care. I'm trying to get to the club. Yeah. He's trying to get up out there where the chick's at. That was his thought. You right. know what I'm saying? So it wasn't the same mentality. Right. right. If, if I could say that, it wasn't really the same mentality. So it was, it was, it was, it was a, it was, you know, they were they were night and day. And I do like working with, you know, people that are tough and believe, because they don't. Your toughness doesn't doesn't scare me. Right. I mean, it's like, um, you know, I, I look at uh, the way I, I used to hear the way that Kobe used to approach his teammates and mm -hmm. go off on them and stuff like that. But he was bringing the best out of them. Right. Yeah. And sometimes you need that. You need yeah. that kick in the pants. Absolutely. For you to figure out that you're not giving your all. Right. Yeah. You know. So yeah, I don't mind working with with a uh, big stars. I worked with Eddie Murphy. Uh, uh, you've never seen any of my work that I've done with Eddie. But I wrote three scripts with Eddie, and maybe one will see the light of day one day. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. But working with Eddie was wild because when I first worked with Eddie, I got a phone call, and my buddy Trent is very tight with him. 
and he gives a, he gives me a call. He says, hey, Eddie wants to see you up at the house uh, right away. Bring your computer. I said, for, for what? He goes, I don't know. You got an idea, man. Don't You, you said you wanted to work with Eddie. I, I right. set it up. Be here. So I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> so I go up to Eddie's crib, and Eddie's watching TV outside on his patio, and I'm standing there for about 10 minutes. He never even looked at me. He's just staring at his TV, and he's like sitting there. He's watching TV, and I'm going, do I... <laughs> do I jump, double this? Do I jump in yeah. and say what's up, or do I let him finish? So I let him finish, and finally he looked right at me, and he said, you "Got your computer?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Did Trent tell you the idea?" And I said, "No." Nah, he just said that he wanted me to. In the middle of me talking, he just he just stopped me and did like this. Okay, here's the idea. I don't. I don't see writing. Oh, oh, oh yes. Yeah. My bad. So, so I'm pulling my laptop out. Hold on one second, charging up. Exactly. All of that, all of that. And so now I'm typing, and he starts talking, and he's just talking. He doesn't go into this a movie. He just starts talking. Mm -hmm. So I'm typing. I'm trying to keep up with him, and then he goes. Uh, so I so I said, well, what about right here? And what if we do this? And he looked at me, nodded his head, and he goes, okay. So if we're gonna do this. Let me just go ahead and put this out there. Hopefully I don't offend you, but I really don't care. <laughs> Get this so real goes, quick. So he goes, this is an idea that I've had. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in anything that you have to say. Mm. You're here to mm -hmm. write my vision. Mm -hmm. So you'll have time to put in all the input that you want, but right mm -hmm. now, I got to get it all out of my head, right. and you get it on paper, and I'd appreciate that if you uh, if you let me do that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I mean, I'm 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 such a fan of this dude, right? right. Yeah. I like like I'm like sitting here looking at the god of comedy, yeah. and I'm going, oh my god, this is crazy. And so then and so I said, okay, cool, man, yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. And so now uh, my boy Trent's in the room, and he's looking at me like this. Just, just go ahead. <laughs> don't, don't, don't fuck this up. <laughs> So I started writing this stuff down, and he goes, are you available tomorrow at the same time? I said, yep. I came back the next day. Three days in a row, I did the same thing. And then on the third day, it was like, hey, you hungry? Uh, well, yeah. He's like, all right, cool. Let's go have dinner. So we go and eat dinner. And then he loosened up a little bit mm -hmm. and, you know, started asking me questions about, you know, so, hey, man, where you live at now? And all this kind of stuff. And I'm, I met Eddie 20 years prior to that. Right. But I'm, but I'm not, I don't have a relationship with yeah. him. Uh, he knows me. He knows who I am, but mm -hmm. we don't have a relationship. So now we're talking. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I realized what the game was. The game was, no, you're not here to write your ideas. You're here to write his ideas. And then once you get them on paper, then you make a suggestion. And I did that. And, uh, you know, it worked out, you yeah. know. So then he was like, hey, you want to write another movie? Mm -hmm. And the thing about Eddie, he was very generous. I was there to write for free. Mm -hmm. And the first time I wrote with him, he said, hey, man, call Sharice and have her, you know, give her your information. I gave her my information. He said, man, come up here, pick up a check. So I go pick up a check, 30 grand. I'm like, mm. <laughs> I appreciate it. Nice. You know, I mean, something I was, you know, wasn't yeah. expecting to get paid for. I was right. writing down some ideas. And then the next one, it was like, Hey man, uh, you know I'm, I'm thinking about this idea. I know you're working and everything right now. I think we were doing Love That Girl at the time, and he was like, "But I, I need you today. Don't worry, I'll, I'll take care of you." And you go up there, he hands you a check for forty grand. Mm. I'm like, yeah. What? Whoa, <clears throat> whoa, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so it was that kind of thing. He's very, very generous, and he's like, you know, if we sell it. They'll work out a deal. They'll pay you more. Right. Right. You know, but in the meantime, just for these ideas, let's just do it like that. So it was, it was really cool. Mm -hmm. Real, real cool. That's a beautiful thing. So when, when and how, kind of going back a little bit, when and how does uh, Jamie Foxx, when does Foxx come into the picture? So Foxx came into the picture because, so I met, I met Jamie years and years and years ago. Uh, before, was, before yeah. Martin? Oh, before, before the show? I, before I was even doing Martin. Oh, yeah. Okay. I met Jamie. He was new in town. He was living on a, in an apartment off of Wilshire. And I was doing a student film, uh, acting in the student film for a friend of mine who was in, in school. And she lived in the same building as this dude down the hall named Eric. So, you know, I go down go down the hallway. She said, I want you to meet this dude named Eric. He's new in town. He's a comic, blah, blah, blah. 
So I go meet Eric, mm -hmm. and Eric's playing his keyboard in his mm -hmm. apartment with no furniture, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we kick it for like three or four days. Mm -hmm. He's funny as I don't know what. <clears throat> so then, a year later, Martin is doing a show in San Francisco for New Year's Eve, and I go, and they got Martin Lawrence, Tommy Davidson, and Jamie Foxx on the bill. So when Jamie comes out with his piano and everything, he's on stage, and I'm going, that ain't, that's air. <laughs> I know him. That's, I know dude, right? <laughs> so so when I, what after, you know, between the show, I go backstage, I'm like, this, Eric, what's up, bro? You remember me? He's like, it's Jamie. I'm like, uh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> something, something's not right here. And he goes, yeah, I go by Jamie now. And I was like, okay, cool. Right? Cool. No problem. I never asked another question about it yep. until we until we started doing the show. Then I said, hey, man, what's the deal with the Jamie Foxx thing? <laughs> and that's when he broke it down for me. But um, so that's when I met him. So then when I was at when I was doing Martin and we were season four, seemed like the show was coming to an end. It wasn't really gelling anymore. Uh, you know, you could just feel the tension on the set and stuff like that, that people were getting antsy and wanted to do other things. And so my agent said, hey man, look, it's your time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take you on the tour. And I'm like, what is I don't even know what that means. So we're gonna take you to all the major studios in Hollywood and we're gonna get you a development deal, or one of them. So they set these meetings up with all the heads and I go in there and put on a song and dance with my agents and they're asking me questions and I'm telling them a little bit about myself and what I wanna do in the business and all that kind of stuff. And then you wait a week for somebody to get back with you and say, we yeah. want to do a deal with you. So I, I went to all the studios, Paramount, Universal, Disney, uh, TriStar, Columbia, Sony, Damn. Warner Brothers, the whole, uh, the whole nine. And so my agent said, well, uh, you got an offer from uh, TriStar. Really? Yep. They want to, you know, they want to pay you X amount of dollars. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Let's do it. No, 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 no. We're going to wait. Well, we got an offer. We yeah, about? let's go. So I'm like, wait a minute, we're waiting for Warner Brothers. So then Warner Brothers comes in with an offer. I'm like, okay, well, their 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 money's not as much as you know TriStar's money. He's like, yeah, but you got to go with the prestige. It's Warner Brothers. Right. Then another one came in, and I was like, okay, so I got three offers, and so now you got to make the decision. So I decided to go with Warner Brothers. So now you're on you're on the Warner Brothers lot. I'm still doing Martin at the same time, and nobody over there knows what's happening. I ain't told nobody. I ain't told the writers. <laughs> nobody knows. I'm like, I'll be back. I got a, I got a lunch down the street. I'm going to these meetings, right? right. And so, I, so now I'm on the Warner Brothers lot. They give me an office, and they had a roster, and they give you the roster, and the roster would say all of the different um, talent that they had deals with. So you're looking through the roster, oh, Jennifer Aniston, blah, 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 all these different, George Clooney, all these different people. Ah, Jamie Foxx. I was like, hey, Jamie Foxx, I know this dude. I want to do a show with him. And they're like, well, yeah, but there's other people on the lot. Just keep looking, keep looking. I'm looking a couple more days. Yeah, I like this dude, Jamie Foxx. Can you set up a meeting? So they're like, yeah, well, they already have a showrunner attached to him already, and They've got some ideas they're trying to work out. Mm -hmm. You probably want to take some other meetings. So I take some other meetings. I met with Paula Abdul. Oh, I was wow. meeting with all kinds of. It was weird. It was a strange. Had a vision already of what you were trying to do? No, or you were just, nothing. So when you were pitching, what were you saying? Like, well, I wasn't really pitching anything. It was just, just more like meet and greets. Right. You know, like we were sitting around having lunch and uh, Tracy Ellis Ross, all these different wow. people that would just sit or sit. You know, it was like, hey, you know, you got an idea? You know, or just mm -hmm. hey, maybe we'll work together. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Right. So. So okay. by the time they finally said, all right, we'll set up a meeting with you and Jamie. So uh, they set up a meeting, and it was with Jamie's manager uh, and his wife. They were they a were, uh, management team. And so they were very much, they out of Oakland, and they giving me the, they giving me the. <laughs> what you got? Yeah. What you doing? <laughs> yeah. So. I was, you know, trying to trying to connect on the Oakland level. Like, right. hey, you know, I was born in Oakland, right? right? Yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'm like, ah, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to really. Yeah. So I'm like, well, where's Jamie? So finally, Fox comes in about halfway through the meeting. He comes in, and he don't have nothing to say. He walks in, how you doing? Like, so I said, hey man, yeah, you, 
Yeah, we we know each we other. Vibed before, right? yeah. We vibed before. Remember yeah. apartment? Yeah. You had the keyboard. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, no furniture. furniture. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was like this. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. And he, and he and he wouldn't make eye contact with me. So you know, when somebody don't make eye contact, you just it's kind of intimidating. You're kind of like, oh shit, they don't like me. What's <laughs> yes, going on? Look at them. Right? It was, it was weird, right? <laughs> and so uh, so uh, I say, man, well, I got some ideas on some you know some stuff. And he was like, oh yeah, what ideas you got? So I just started throwing out some little one liners. What if you we're at a, works for a music company, right? And we do this show, the show's about a record company and you're an exec there. And he was like this, now nah, like that. Okay. <laughs> and everything that I was throwing out was about music because right. I knew he sang. I was right. trying to connect. He was like, nah, I'm not feeling that. So then, you know, he started talking about where he was from and all this kind of stuff. And I, I knew that he wasn't going to work with me. So I just, I just got a little arrogant. I say, man, I don't know but nothing about uh, that shit, man. I don't, have a, I don't have that story. I didn't grow up poor. Mm-hmm. We had shit. We had Lincoln Continentals and big houses and shit. I don't know nothing about that, right? And so he started laughing, and I was like this. Hey, man, it's true, man. I don't know. I don't have that hard luck story right. that these, these other niggas got. I ain't, right. Got, right. I ain't got that story. Right. And so I was like, well, cool, man. If we finish with lunch, I'm cool. I'm out. So I leave, and I get a phone call as I'm, le- as I'm you know, maybe a couple of miles away, and my agent calls me and goes, Hey man, what happened at the meeting? I said, I don't know, man. It's just, you know, I don't think it, I don't think it's the right fit. I gotta figure out something. He goes, No, 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 no. They want you to go back. How far are you? Are you in Hollywood yet? I said, Nah, I'm still up here in the valley. Uh-huh. He said, Man, go back down to Warner Brothers. They want to meet with you again. I said, I just left. They said, Go to Jamie's office on the lot. They got a drive on for you. So I go to the office and Jamie's standing in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. It was really weird. <laughs> he's standing in the parking lot and he, he started pointing at me. He said, I want to holler at you. I said, what's up? He goes, I like that shit you said. You ain't got no hard luck story. That shit, yeah, well, you got me with that one. I was like, well, I was just telling the truth. <laughs> he said, man, look, I think, you know, the, the shit you did for Martin, I think we could probably vibe on something. You know, you got some, some stuff you could do like that with me? And I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he goes, all right, cool, I got an idea. I said, what's the idea? He said, I want to do a show about a hotel uh, and I'm working at the hotel. And I say, and what? He goes, you figure out the rest. That's it. (laughs) That was it. Right. (laughs) Fill in the blanks. He said, I'm leaving town, going to do some dates. When I get back, show me something. Mm -hmm. So while he was away, I worked put some stuff together, and I sent it to him while he was away. Mm-hmm. And this, you, know, you had literally had to send it to him. Yeah. I had to send it to him, FedEx it to where he was going to be. And he came back with some notes, but he was like, I like this, but I want to do this, 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 and I want to change this character, but I like this. And uh, so then he was like, let's go pitch it. So now we go into Warner Brothers, and we go, hey, here's what, we wanna, uh, what we'd like to present to you. And uh, David Giannolari, who was the second head of Warner Brothers at the time, he goes, I like that idea. Yeah, we'll buy that. We'll buy that. So now we have to go find a network. Mm -hmm. So Warner Brothers is the production company. Mm -hmm. Now we got to go find a network. So then we go to ABC, NBC, CBS, WB, Fox, all of them. And and the only person that bit was ABC. So ABC says, yeah, we like this guy. We'll we'll do a show with him. But so, yeah, we'll give you a... We'll buy your. We'll, we'll we'll pay you to write a pilot. Well, we go to WB, which was a new network, and they go, well, we we'll give you a guaranteed six episodes on air. Say less, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, uh, that sounds good. And so Jamie's manager and Jamie, they were all against it. Now nah, we're going to ABC. We, ABC. I said, yo, we go to ABC. They gonna cancel the show. Mm-hmm. And he, they were like, no, hanging with Mr. Cooper's on ABC, and they didn't cancel that. And Marcus who was his manager, he was also Mark Curry's manager. Uh-huh. So he's like, we got one on ABC, let's go with ABC. I said, all right, we're gonna be dead within, uh, we might not even get on air. <laughs> right. That was just my feeling. And so I convinced Jamie, let's go with the WB. They're gonna give us six guaranteed episodes yeah. on, on the air. air. Yeah. Sm- big fish in a small pond, let's take over that. Mm-hmm. They got the Wayans brothers over there, but they ain't doing nothing. Let's, mm-hmm. let's take over the, the network. And that's exactly what, what happened. And, Marcus was a little, they, they were a little mad at me about that. I think they were, uh, they felt like I had Fox's ear mm-hmm. and they didn't like that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, 
uh, it put a wedge in our relationship at the time. We're cool. Of course, we're cool now, but it put a wedge in our relationship. But um, that's how that whole thing happened. That's what the whole how the whole Jamie thing came to play. So once we made the decision, we just went in there and, and uh, hired a staff, you know, brought in a staff of writers. And uh, I brought some homies from the neighborhood in because I was like, you know, Martin gave me that, he hooked me up, right. so now I'm going to hook up some cats, and I brought the funniest dudes from my neighborhood in, mm -hmm. and I put them on staff, and we built the whole entire staff with some other writers and producers, and, uh, oh, when we did the pilot, when we shot the pilot, it tested as the highest tested pilot in Warner Brothers history. Wow. <laughs> right? That's crazy. That's over that's Friends. Friend. Yeah, that's every, amazing. Everybody, right? It was... It, it was so off the Richter that they go, no, there was some kind of mistake. We, we got to do it again. <laughs> I promise you. So we tested again, right? They never gave us the results. Right. They broke the record again. Yeah. Yeah. They broke it all record. It did. They never gave us the results. They just go, oh, okay, so we're going to do this show. And we shot the show. That's six, that six guarantee turned into how many seasons? A uh, hundred episodes. Uh, uh, Syndicated. Five seasons, yeah. Syndicated. Yeah. yeah. Man. Do you see a big correlation with, because the WB became the place for us. Right. Yeah. Became yeah. black, Latino. Right. It was like we could see people that look like us on that network. Yeah. Do you see a correlation with what Warner Brothers, excuse me, what, uh, what the WB was then to what's going on now with them letting in all these black, Latino, Asian creators and hearing their voices? Do you see a correlation with that moment in time to right now? Well, the, the, the way that I see it is that uh, from the beginning of time uh, in television, uh, black shows have always been the flagship shows to launch a network. Mm. So, you know, just doing my research and stuff like that, the very first successful sitcom on television was a show called Beulah, and it was starring a black woman. She was a maid, uh, and I want to say it was Hattie McDaniel, the first Oscar, what black Oscar, Oscar winner. But then they changed the casting to somebody else. But that was a big hit. Amos and Andy was a big hit. Yeah. Uh, these were like CBS shows and they were rivaling I Love Lucy and all that kind of stuff back then. Uh, and so they've always been there to do that. And then they go away because they go, okay, we, we, we've got, now we got an audience. Right. <laughs> let's, do the, let's do these white shows, right? right? And so then it's like, hey, well, what about it? Uh, we're going to go a different way. And then a resurgence happens in the 70s, and you get, hey, Red Fox, let's do a show with Sanford and Son. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. And the Jeffersons, because they were such a big hit on All in the Family, let's do a spinoff. And then, hey, let's spin that character off from Maude and do this Good Time show. Mm -hmm. And then, so we're hot. These are all CBS shows, right? And so then they disappear because it's like, okay, we've got enough. We've got an audience. Right. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they've been doing it for years. Yeah. So then comes Fox, of course, In Living Color, uh, Martin, uh, Living Single, same thing. Then Fox gets good enough. Oh, let's do 9120, 91320, or whatever that show was. <laughs> you know? and, then, and then it's like, all right, so where are the opportunities for black shows? Yeah, we'll give them a pilot on NBC or nothing gets picked up. But then the WB comes and it's like, now uh, nobody wanted to be on the WB. Mm. Yeah. You know, no, nobody wanted to be on there except for some black shows. So it's like, hey, let's, now we blow up the WB, then they create U, UPN. Oh. So now it's the WB and UPN, yeah, wow. and they're both stealing all the, all the black advertising dollars, right? right? There's no place, they're, they're splitting it. So it's like, hey, let's merge. Get rid of one, and now they call it the CW, right? Mm -hmm. And then, hey, let's get rid of all those black shows. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> let's We've seen what, we've they've seen been doing. Yeah, we've seen the they've scale. been doing it, dude, since the beginning of time. It's wow. been it's been a it's a historic thing. So then they go into um, uh, shows like Blackish and stuff like that that prove that there's still a big audience for that, mm -hmm. even in this this is modern times, right? Yeah. So, but remember, there was a time, and you were there. You remember because there was a time where the uh, reality shows came in, and there were no. No black shows on yeah. TV, none, yeah. not one, right? And so then there becomes a Tyler Perry. Mm -hmm. 
that comes in with his plays and says, I'm going to do TV. And I'll tell you how I met Tyler and, and all that kind of stuff and what I told him. But he proved me wrong. And he became, he has some islands and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But he, um, he, he came in there at a time where he hit it at the right position, at the right time. It was perfect timing. And he blew up. And then right after that, uh, I did uh, Love That Girl. And so we started getting that attention. We, we were up for our Image Award our very first year on an independently produced show yeah, wow. and stuff like that. But I was trying to sell it to the big networks. Nobody was biting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I was like, All right, well, I'll just mess with these small networks. No big deal. It's the same money. Mm -hmm. I don't care. No big deal. And so, um, you know, watching that gradual change, it's gotten to the point like like I said with Blackish and some other shows and stuff like that, they're that are either, they're taking chances again. Mm -hmm. So, but it's a copycat society. The network, the big networks, they see it working, and then they go, "Hey, let's try. Let's get our black show." Mm -hmm. They got one right now. What's the one where the guy from Mike and Molly? He's married to an African girl now. Have you seen that show? I haven't seen it's it. It's a I've seen like the uh, on the buses though, yeah. So I guess they said, we gonna go as black as you can go. We going to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so they got the African dude, I mean the African woman and the, and the white guy, Mike. That's and crazy. it's it's like literally on one of the big ne networks. I think it's on ABC, I want to say. But it's on there. No, CBS. Mm -hmm. It comes on right after Cedric's The Neighborhood. But then again, like Cedric's show is working. Yeah. So we, you know, th they work. Mm -hmm. It's just how much money and effort do they want to put in the show to, uh, to these shows and now with all this stuff that's been happening with all the George Floyd stuff and all that mm -hmm. now they feel like hey we got to we you know it's a mandate Obviously. now we got to do that and we also got to look out now for uh, black females so mm -hmm. now they're giving those opportunities and stuff so it's, it's changing the, the landscape has changed a lot and um, hopefully uh, it'll continue to change but now I think TV is going to change. I think it's going to disappear. It's going to be all the streamers. Yeah. I think. I, you know. I agree. What was that that mentality shift to go from working, you know, WB and, uh, you know, wherever the Martin Show was to doing it independently? Like, what's that shift in your mind and how did you kind of gear yourself up to do that? Because that's kind of a big undertaking. Get a studio space, get and, and front the whole thing. Like, what's that like? So I... I had I known that it was going to be as hard as it is, uh -huh. I would have never done it, number one. Number two, you do things out of, out of necessity. Right. So, um, th like I said, they're looking for, they're not looking for me in mm -hmm. Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Hollywood's looking for the younger version of me. Right. Hollywood's looking for y'all. Right. Right. And so, um, they stop calling, you mm -hmm. know. Um, the Christmas gift stopped coming from CAA. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> basket this year. What, <laughs> what about me, Michael Ovens? <laughs> right. I, I mean, everything start, you know, starts slowing down, and you're going, well, damn, what happened here, right? And so you're asking your agent, hey, man, can you, can you uh, get me a meeting? And, yeah, you know, Bentley, they're not really doing any of those shows right now. Mm, you're geez. like, what do you mean, those shows? And I, you know, I'm just going to be honest with you. You want me to be honest with you? Yeah. Uh, so then you go, damn, there's really nothing for me to do. Okay, maybe I'll start doing some movies, mm -hmm. right? And you know the movie game is very tough. Yeah. So unless you got a piece of talent that's attached. Mm -hmm. Not touching it. Yeah, not touching it, right? Mm -hmm. So then it was like, okay, well, um, what do I do now? I got out the business. I said, I'm going to start flipping real estate. Mm -hmm. And man, <laughs> I think I, I flipped the, the very first house I flipped, I made like $180,000. I was uh -huh. like, TV, what? Get out of here. Who needs you? Doing that, right? <laughs> so then you start flipping. I'm like, oh shit, I'm, I, I flipped three, three in like six months. Uh -huh. And it, it got so good. I was like, I ain't never going back into TV, oh, right? Uh -huh. And then the real estate market crashed. Yeah. 2008 or whatever it was. And yeah. it was like, you can't get a loan. So I got houses that I've worked on and they, they look beautiful <laughs> and I can't sell them because can't nobody get along. Right? Yeah. And I was going, whoa, what do I do here, right? So mm -hmm. it was disastrous. It was like, these houses, I gotta, I gotta let them foreclose on them or what? Because I can't, I can't pay five house notes. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, no. and, you know, I'm gonna go broke doing that, mm -hmm. right? So I just walked away from a whole bunch of that stuff, did short sales, mm -hmm. whatever I could do to get them get off the books yeah. and stay out of jail. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it clean. <laughs> Keep it clean. Uh -huh. So I did all that, and then, um, and then, and then uh, I get a call one day from my agent. And he says, "Hey, do you know uh, 
do you know a Tyler Perry? You know who a Tyler Perry is? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, yeah, I met dude. I met him. He's, he's, yeah, I met him. He, he said, well, he's doing a show, a couple of shows down in Atlanta. Uh, you, you have any interest in going down there and meeting with him? I said, yeah, when, when? They were like this, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go. So I shoot down to Atlanta. I go to Tyler's studio. And, you know, he looks at me and he goes, glad you made it. And I was like, yeah, man, this is crazy. What you, this is bananas what you got going on here, right? And this was the, the first studio he had. Right. The, the new one is like, <laughs> man. The, so the new studio is bigger than NBC, ABC, Disney, Universal, Paramount, and Warner Brothers combined. Yeah. So oh, that's what it is. Yeah. It's humongous, Ooh. right? So, but the first one was impressive enough for me. I was like, <laughs> got sound stages in here? This is really cool. So what happened was during that experience, it was, it was really weird, man, what happened. Because I'm working, he's doing this new show called Meet the Browns. It had never, it had never been on the air yet, but he was showing me, mm -hmm. he's sitting there and watching these episodes. So I watched him, he's like, okay, so I called you down here because I want you to write some of these episodes. I got a problem with the guild and I need some WGA writers. Mm -hmm. I didn't think you'd show up. I was mm -hmm. like, why? Yeah, well, you know, you're a showrunner. I was like, so what? Mm -hmm. I want to work with great people, man. I hear mm -hmm. about what you're doing. So I write two episodes for him. I'm in Atlanta for a week. I'm like, what? I can go in here and grab me a quick little 45 G's? Mm -hmm. I'm, about, I'm about to go get that. Right? <laughs> yeah, so I sat there and begged those scripts out. Uh, I was staying over with a friend of mine. And uh, I turned them in. And so then I came back home. And they were like, hey, Tyler wants you to come back. I said, cool. I go back down there. Oh, yeah, I'll go get another, mm -hmm. I'll get another 25, mm -hmm. see what I can do, right? So, but when I went back down there, it was a, this cat I used to run with. He was, he was, a, he was my brother-in-law. He was married to my wife's sister. You, do you remember Eddie? No. You don't remember Eddie? Uh, Sheldon and his dad. Sheldon and Zachary, oh, yeah, yeah, their yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm hanging out with Eddie, and he says, hey, Ben, I got this guy I want you to meet. So we, in the middle of the night, we ride, we riding through Atlanta and we going through the sticks that we talked about <laughs> earlier, right? And we pull up on this little, this little uh, strip mall and this dude's standing in, in front of the strip mall. He's got on a suit and tie and it's late at night. I'm like, is, is he an undertaker with that? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you taking me, man? <laughs> so when I get out the car, the guy goes, Bentley Kyle Levins. <laughs> man, it's a pleasure to have you down in these parts. And I was like, but Eddie's like, just go along with it. <laughs> so he, I said, hey, man, what's going on? He goes, hey, man, I wanted to meet you. I want to show you something. So he takes me in his office. He pops in a DVD. And he shows me this sitcom that he created. And it had, like, uh, Jasmine Guy, uh, Robin Givens, a couple of faces yeah, yeah, that yeah. I knew. And I was like, I mean, the sitcom was terrible. But it looked fantastic. <laughs> uh -huh. And it looked great. Right. And I was like, this is Yo, what is this? He goes, yeah, it's a show I created. I said, what do you mean you created? He goes, I created this show. And I was like, um, so when you say you created, he goes, I wrote the show and this is the idea that I have. My parents, my, it was my parents, my sisters, and me. That's what it was called. So I said, well, where did, where did you shoot this? He goes, come on, let's take a walk. So we walk down this hallway and he opens up these two big doors and the sound stage was there. He took this warehouse and converted it. And I saw all these sets built and they were built beautiful, look like Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. I went, what the hell? He goes, this is where I shot it. Mm -hmm. I said, man, what is this? He goes, it's my studio. Mm -hmm. So I, my head was blown. Yeah. All I could think of was like, what have I been doing? What, I, I couldn't figure this out. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, man, this is, this is what I've been doing. And I'd like for you to come down here and direct some of these episodes for me. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. He was like, I said, yeah, I'm down here with Tyler doing such and such. He was like, forget what he's talking about. You should come direct some of these. So I leave, come back to L.A., grab up some more clothes. I go back down to Atlanta and I direct like maybe four episodes of this show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I bring some actors from L.A., and we shot these these episodes, and they were really, really good episodes, right? He never he never got them on the air, and then he ended up caught up in some drama, and I think he ended up going to jail or something like that. Yeah. But but the but the one thing that I got out of it was he showed me the game. Right? Yeah. So I was like, oh, I could do that. Mm -hmm. 
And then I came back home and I was telling my, my boy Trent about it. And Trent was like this, hey man, we could do that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you think so? He's like, yeah, you got an idea? So I said, yeah, I got an idea. He said, tell me the idea. I told it to him and he said, I'll set up the rest. Cool. And we hooked up with our boy Raphael Sadiq, mm. uh, who had a recording studio over here in uh, North, North, North Hollywood. And he had this big garage space that he wasn't doing anything with. Mm -hmm. And so Trent said, we can shoot in here. I said, we gonna shoot in this garage space. He says, just, you wanna do it? Right. So I said, all right, I'll do it. And then I called on everybody that I knew. Uh, my wife was doing uh, interior design stuff. So she was in school for it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you wanna do this? And she was like, yeah, I can do the sets. I was like, in my mind, <laughs> I don't know if she's gonna be able to pull this off. That's a lot of work, right? Yeah. So she was like, I got it. So then it was like, you know, I can get this person, I can get this person. So I started calling my family members, like Monty, everybody, mm -hmm. Stacy, everybody, just called on everybody. I was like, let's, let's put this thing together. So we built these sets, and then it was like, hey, let's shoot this thing. Where are we gonna get the money? Because mm -hmm. this is gonna be a hefty cost. And I can't afford to do that right now because this is going to cost, in my mind, I was thinking about a half a million dollars. Right. So we was at the Lakers game. And my nephew, Niall, he said, hey, Ben, there go Jeff Franklin right there. Now, Jeff Franklin had created Full House. Wow. Mm. He had created uh, mm. Hanging with Mr. Cooper, a few shows. And he had a big-ass house up on the top of uh, Benedict Canyon. Mm -hmm. he, he lives in the house. He bought the house that Sharon Tate got murdered in. Oh, the shit. Charles Charles Manson house. I feel like you gotta stay yeah. away from yeah. that, right? Yeah, right? You gotta yeah. get the sage out. Yeah. Jeez. And so, Bad juju. so I said, so I walked over to Jeff and I was like, hey Jeff, man, how you doing, man? I knew him, you know, because he was at Warner Brothers for a while. Right. I said, hey man, you, you, you still doing TV? He goes, nah, they won't let me in, they blackballed me. <laughs> that was fuckers. Said, you know, Jeff is Jeff's a wild boy. He's uh, He's the black. He's the white Hugh. Hef he's the Hugh, the new Hugh Hefner. Uh -huh. Chicks, the whole nine yards. He's a playboy. Right. Uh, Jeff's probably in his sixties, close to seventy. Never had kids. Single dude. The whole nine yards. Right. <laughs> so, but he lives in this big ass lair. So I said, man, I got an idea, man. Man, I'd love to talk to you about it. He said, well, come up to my house, man. I'll have lunch set out for us. So I ride up to the haunted mansion. On <laughs> <laughs> that mansion. And when I get there, I'm like, oh, this shit is crazy. This, I mean, the place was bananas, right? right. I'd never seen that. He had a shark tank in his in his dining room. It was crazy, Whoa. right? Yeah. And so he's got a he's got a chef. Cause I, you know, I'm like this. I'm gonna pick him up. We're gonna go down to Beverly Hills, eat yeah, some food. Yeah, grab some food. You know, oh, the chef is cooking. Do you eat sushi? What are you eating? Yeah. So he, they cook, and it was just he and I sitting out overlooking the city. And he goes, what did you want to talk to me about? So I explained who Tyler Perry was to him. He had never heard his name before. Mm. And I said, I got an idea. We could produce a show. He goes, nah, I'm not really into that kind of stuff because every time I invest money into something, I never win. Mm -hmm. He said, how much money are you talking? I said, hey, Jeff, you know, uh, I could use about 300000 He's like, so what are you going to do with it? I said, well, I'm going to shoot these episodes. I got 10 and I wrote 10 episodes, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. So I got these 10 episodes, and he was like, uh, well, um, hmm. <laughs> I tell you what, I don't believe that you can do 10. I said, yeah, I can get 10 done. He goes, I don't believe it. But I'll give you 200 if you agree to just do four. Mm. Uh, my hands was tied. I was like, yeah, okay. He said, come up here Thursday and pick up a check. I was like, it's like that? You just asked for it? Yeah. So I got the 200000 and we shot the show. Man. I went to Martin, and I was like, but, but the cool thing about Martin was, he was like, I took him to the set, and he saw it, and he was like this, I see your vision, bro, how much money do you need? Mm -hmm. I said, I can't take no money from you. And he was like, what? He was insulted. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I took the money from him and I lost it, mm -hmm. that was it. Yeah. That was the end of our friendship, everything, mm -hmm. right? So I was like, I can't risk that. Yeah. I can't risk that. I said, but what you can do is lend me your name and I'll cut you in on the profits of the show. Mm -hmm. You just come on as exec producer. Mm -hmm. And so we built it that way. Mm -hmm. And so we shot these episodes and we sold them. When and was this? What year? 2009. Wow. Oof. Right after the crash. Right, right after the right. crash. That's a good little comeback. Yeah. yeah. 2009, we hit the air in January 2010. 
And from those four episodes, we ended up doing 65. Wow. And then that took us into Bounce to do, mm -hmm. well, family time, we do 91 episodes. <laughs> Jeez. And then in the cut, 87 episodes. All Yikes. independently produced. All so. independently produced. And it wasn't easy because the people that we were dealing with were not nice people. Right. You know, so it was just a uh, necessity. You had to do it. It was like, okay, I don't really have any other opportunities here. And then it was like, if you if you stay relevant, mm -hmm. that made that kept me relevant. So they're still hearing my name. I'm still popping up in Deadline right. and, and all the trades and stuff like that. But it's like, he's doing it independently. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, people want to be a part of that. Right. Yeah. You know, they're like, hey, you know, you want to do a pilot for us? And then you start hearing about different things. And then, of course, what Fox. And he was like, hey, man, I'm doing this thing over at Netflix. I need you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so, but had I not done that. Right. Uh, independent thing, who knows, man? Sure. Right. I don't yeah. know. You gotta stay relevant. You gotta be relevant. You know, who knows what I'd be doing? I might be managing in and out. <laughs> <laughs> for, for like young dudes like us, you know, um, independent producers as well and stuff, what's the biggest piece of advice you can give us? On the independence? On the independent route. Um, <clears throat> number one, uh, you, you have to just do it. And here's what I mean by that. You got to green light your own success. So mm, yeah, there's yeah. there's this thing in Hollywood that we call the green light. You know, when they yeah. they're gonna green light this project. Yeah. Yeah. And so I came to this conclusion. I'm talking to Sadiq Raphael, and he says, "And hey, what is this thing in Hollywood that you guys call the green light?" And I was like, "Yeah, well, you know, that's when the studio green lights your project." He goes, "I don't understand that." I said, "Yeah, well, you know, it's like." It's like in the record business, I mean, you can't just put out an album. He goes, I record albums all the time. I just right. put out my own shit. I was like, what? And he was like this. So let me ask you a question. If in the middle of the night, you come to an intersection, and it's, and it's a red light, and, you, and that red light don't turn green for about, you sitting there for like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You just gonna stay? You gonna stay, or you gonna green light yourself? Mm -hmm. And it hit, I was like, oh my God, I get it. And so uh, that's what, you know, caused me to just say, I'm going to do it. So I would say you just have to have great ideas and you just have to get them done by hook or crook. You, got, mm -hmm. you can't be afraid to ask mm -hmm. people for help, for mm -hmm. favors. You do not want to ever gamble with your life savings or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you got a little something, you want, I can put up a hundred. That ain't going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. But don't be afraid to ask other investors to come into your project and get it done and just shoot it. You gotta, yeah. you just have to do it because nowadays they want to see proof of your ability to get something done. Yeah. Yeah, I want some oh, chicken wow. nuggets and some fries. I'm oh, cool. wow. Wow. I would love wow. it. Wow. Yeah. Would love yeah. it. Yes, please. Appreciate, Appreciate you. you. Thank you, Aunt Val. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, well, Martin, without you, yeah, it wouldn't be no Martin Lawrence show. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the you know the greatest the greatest uh, sense of advice is and it just comes from personal experience is to not be afraid to just do it and not be afraid to fail right. because you know it, yeah if you think about everything before you do it you're never gonna do it right. if if somebody tells you uh -huh. to walk down to walk down the street and there's a whole bunch of snarling pit bulls mm -hmm. in the middle of the block. Hey, but you got to get to the end. You're not going. You're not going to go down. The, you're not going to go. Because right. common sense is going to tell you not to go. Yeah. So you can't listen to common sense. Mm -hmm. You just got to go, I'm out here. Oh, shit, they're going to pit bull run. You just got to, you just got to, you got to deal with it. Yeah. You just got to go through the, because there's going to be a bunch of bumps in the road. There's no possible way you can make it through without there being bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. They're going to be there. So you just have to uh, literally take a bet on yourself. Yeah. Literally. Mm -hmm. You got you to gotta take a bet on yourself because... Nobody's gonna give you nothing out here right. uh, for free. Yeah. They want to see that you got skin in the game. Mm -hmm. I like how you green lights your own success. Yeah. I want to do a book called the Green uh, Green Light Green Light to Success. Um, I, I, I haven't said you that. Should, sure. Matthew McConaughey That's has a, a book called uh, called Green Light. And so oh, does he? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful book, um, and it's literally about uh, kind of exactly what you just said. How he took every opportunity he had at hand. To, to just green light his own success to any time he, he got to a place where it was like a wall in his life, he was like, well, I got to figure out a way around it, over it, through it. I wasn't going to turn around. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's just everything in life, whether it's a red light, a yellow light, a green light, you know, it's up to you to, to take it on. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's the truth, man. It's, uh oh. It's the truth. Dig in, guys. Yeah. Well, we appreciate what's it like. It like? My uh, bad. No, no, you. What's it like now with the streamers? Like, uh, mm. with where you are now with having a reputation and having successes behind you? What is the uh, what's it like working on the streamers and working with these giants? Because they have now they have the capital and they have the distribution platforms to the world. Yeah. What's what does it feel like? What's the main difference in working with them versus where you've been, and kind of what's to come? What do you feel is to come? Um, I think uh, you know working with the streamers is. Um, I, I love the opportunity of doing that because like what we did with millennials, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the stream, that streaming platform didn't get in our way. They didn't, they didn't give us no notes. Mm -hmm. They just let us have it our own way. Mm -hmm. And they allowed us to be all that we could be with that show. And it's a small network, but they already picked up a second season. So it's like, you know, that's 100% independently produced. Wow. You know what I mean? And the same with Light Show. You know, so now it's like, Oh, a new a new avenue opened up, and they're letting us do it our way, and they're letting us continue to own the content. Mm, right. So they're paying for the shows, but they don't own none of it. We own one hundred percent of it. All wow! Licensed. So it's all licensed. Mm -hmm. That's huge, man. That's exciting. How, how do you how do you want to um, like moving forward? Where do you see things going? Um. So you know, like I said, I think me personally. And you guys will probably probably answer the question better than me. I think that everything is going to go streaming. Right. I really believe that. I agree with that. And I think that with that in mind, the, the days of the big studio is going to end mm -hmm. um, because they're no longer needed. Yeah. When you can figure out a way to, you know, got these cameras and sound and all that stuff, you're basically doing the same thing that a studio is doing, mm -hmm. creating content. Mm -hmm. And so when you can say, I have my own production house, I can do what I want to do, and I think that it's going to change and that in a minute, you're going to be able to have your own streaming platform, right? So you'll have your own Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, it's just now you just got to get people to watch it. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's coming. I think mm -hmm. that's what's going to be the next the next frontier, everybody's gonna have their own platform mm -hmm. real soon. And then somebody will come buy that all up too. Right, right. Uh, like but that's where I see it going. What, what, keeps you, what keeps you motivated, you know, to still be in the game, to still wanna do what you do, to still, you know, like, to give back to people like us, you know? Like, what, why, why do you, like, what keeps you motivated? Why do you do it still? I was gonna laugh and say money, but, <laughs> Okay. But I, I think it's more than that. It's it's um, it's because it's the excitement of creativity. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you've played ball. Mm -hmm. You play ball, and at some point in time, you won't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But you'll still have that that yearning to do something with your time. You don't right. want to sit around. Okay, I'm cool. I got some money. I'm chilling. Right. At some point, you just want to go, you know what? Now, what can I do? Because I'm, you know, I want to build. I want to continue to build um, wealth and also legacy. Yeah. And so I think that's what keeps me motivated, trying to trying to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps me mostly motivated. I'm like, yo, I, I, I never want to be a relic. I never want to be at a point where I don't know what 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 did, what did he say? I, if even if you say a slang right now and I don't know what it means, I want to be able to at least kind of figure. Out, I think I think what they're right. saying. You know right. what I'm saying? Because right. right. no cap. I'm like yeah. when I was a kid, kid, cap meant something else. Now it's different. <laughs> what is, how do I figure that out? You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So just staying relevant um, um, in it and keeping wanting to see where the future is going. You know what I mean? Um, I love this. I love the streaming stuff, man. Yeah. I love the platforms. I love what they've created. And so I want to just continue to make good content um, and 
you know, just continue to push the needle forward, man. I really, I, I think this is important. When I see Norman Lear, who's like 97 years old, <laughs> he still got a deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's still making content. Right. And he's still cool. I don't know if you guys ever seen him, but he's cool as I don't know what. Right? He's still in touch. He still knows what's going on. The dude knows what's going on. I was talking to him in, in Florida. He was just sitting there. I said, man, I'm about to roll up on Norman. I said, Norman, man, what's happening, man? I said, man, I do. I do exactly what you do. He goes, let me correct you, young man. <laughs> he goes, no, you don't. You do what you do. Right. He goes, but we have the same interests. <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay, I never heard it like that. Yeah. And I talked to him for about 15, 20 minutes, took pictures with him. He was cool as I don't know what. Mm -hmm. You awesome. know? Yeah. But it was inspiring. Right. Very so what's, inspiring. What's next? Mm. A movie? I got in the movie business. I did. I wrote a thin line between love and hate. Yeah. Uh, it was number one at the box office that the, the week it came out. Just let them know. Um, I did do that, and I would continue to try to do some movie stuff, but I just don't know if the movie, is the movie business, like in other words, are you guys going to continue to go to the theater? Because with the pandemic. We have this conversation all the time. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm not you sure. Know, I mean, the, the movies nice will stuff. still, you know, be on Netflix and, you know, the Hulus and all that, so there's always going to be a place for it, but that, uh, it's dwindling, the experiential kind of thing, unless you're going to see King Kong versus Godzilla or right. something that's like Long that busted. demands that yeah. big budget films. Right. right, I'm I. You know what? I don't know that I even have the interest in doing that. That's an ego play. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like to. I like series, man. I like yeah. making series and yeah. and um, doing lifestyle stuff. And uh, I like to do um, a drama of some sort at some point. You know, just to really. Uh, exercise that muscle a little bit and do something other than comedy. What I really would love to do is do a a, a horror film. Mm. And what I saw Jordan Peele do mm -hmm. was uh, whatever the movie was. Get Out. Or? Get out. Yeah. Right. What I saw Get Out, it, it, I won't say it made me, it, well, it kind of made me mad because I was thinking, I was just mad because I was like, he did it and I didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, he comes from the comic world too, mm -hmm. but he proved that it could be done. And um, yeah, I know it was a big, 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 huge hit, monster hit. I wasn't crazy impressed with it. I didn't think it was all that, but I, it was it was good. Mm -hmm. But what was more impressive than it being good, he did it. Absolutely, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what impressed me. And so I wouldn't mind doing something like that, a, a great horror film, and um, but we'll see. Right on. We'll see. Man. Right on. You know. Well. Uh, oh, and also, um, I do have, you know, you know about the MBT thing that I'm doing, right? MBT? I'm out here trying not to say too much. Uh, so, I was saying everybody's going to have their own streaming platform. Mm. So I put together my own with Trent. Uh, we put together MBT, it's National Black Television. Mm, that's dope. And so we're making our own content. <clears throat> The app is already up. It's on Apple TV. It's on uh, Roku. It's on Fire Stick. It's on all of these different platforms. Plus, there's an app in the App Store that you can get it on. It's 24 hours of programming. Mm -hmm. um, and we just did a deal. Trent's actually in Jamaica right now. But we just did a deal where we got on the cable platform in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. wow. Just in the Caribbean. So now we're in you know, 25 million households on their cable platform. So it's on this cable platform called Flow. And Flow is the equivalent of, say, uh, Comcast, or what's the one that everybody has now? Spectrum. 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 Mm -hmm. So Flow is like Spectrum, mm, but man. from the Caribbean. Yeah. Mm. So all of the homes that have pay TV over there in the entire Caribbean, which is like 40 million people, they have either Flow or Digicel, and so, but Flow is the biggest, so we're on Flow right now. So now, you know, if you're in Jamaica, you can go in there and that's turn pretty, on the. That's, that's a pretty big deal, right there. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. A big yeah. That was, that was right because there. they lost access to what is it, BT or? Well, they're not. They're not supposed to have BT. They have it. It's pirated. Mm. Uh, they're not supposed to have that. They're not supposed to have anything from America, but they pirate it all the time because you know. That's what everybody wants. Mm-hmm. So. 
I think the next frontier is to um, to really get that up and up and moving. See how big we can make it, and either sell it or keep it and continue to build it. Mm -hmm. But you know, for me, I ain't got to be the richest guy in the world, so I love to sell it. Right. Yeah. And ride off into the sunset. <laughs> Hit another Cancun yacht trip. Yeah, you yeah. <laughs> know. Do some more of that. Yeah, do something else. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Here, here. Beautiful. Yeah. Right. Man, well, we appreciate you. Yeah, for yeah, real. Taking the time. You. That was great. Giving that wisdom. Green light your success. That's like one that's yeah. that's going to stick with me for a minute. You know? Yeah, man. I'm doing a book right now called, um, uh, called The Hollywood Blueprint. Okay. And this is basically based on my experience mm. in the business. It's not a how-to book, mm -hmm. but you could read it and you could go, okay, these are the steps that he took. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I take some of the similar steps, you know, because nobody has the same story. Right. Um, I could tell you, I could tell you 100% how to be successful, mm -hmm. but you, you may not be successful because Times have changed. Different, you know, different scenarios have mm -hmm. come into play that would go. Oh, that's you can't do that anymore. You know, mm -hmm. so so mine is just basically a book of principles, mm. and it should be. I should drop it uh, fourth quarter of this year. There it is. Um, but it's cool. It's it's. Uh, we're just about finished with it. Mm -hmm. About two hundred pages. Should be an easy read. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and man, success leaves up. tracks. It does. Yeah. Success yeah. leaves tracks, but it's up to you to follow. Them. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. Well, you have, we really thank you. Yeah, man, this is dope. Absolutely, man, appreciate amazing. it. Yeah, it's a real full circle moment for us, you know. Given it wasn't that long ago we were yeah, kids in the pool, in the pool. Right. <laughs> right? Right, right, right. <laughs> the story how it all came to fruition. Yeah, so man, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Absolutely, yeah. you know, and all the rest of it is just you know little dashes in between yeah. mm -hmm. the stories and different things. Um, but that's the you know that's the overall. Uh, uh, you know, to my career, and like I said, it's been it's been 35 years. I'm, I'm like yeah, blown away amazing. by that, that's you right. know. But you know, continue to push. I I don't think that I'll ever uh, retire. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be one of those things when they just say, "Okay, you can't do it no more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you can't leave. No, you can't leave the house no more." All right. But I'll continue to push. I love this. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. You can Thank you it. for having us over yeah, to your house. Real. You Thank know, you. it's beautiful here. Absolutely. We might, you might catch us in the backyard. You might leave. We'll still be here chilling. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> man. I've been, oh, I've been getting that tennis going, so anytime hey, you man, are you right we'll out here? We're going to get the kids out here. Yeah, yeah man. It's time, huh? Get the oh, trainers. Whatever. <laughs> whatever you want. You know, whatever you want. But uh, yeah, me and Rip been playing a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's my guy. I love him. Yeah. I'm out on my game after that guy. Yeah? Best I want to play a little bit. Best off-ball basketball player ever. Whenever. I'm trying to get like nice, nice. three days a weekend. Yep. Tennis, I might need to get in there. I feel like the, the hoop was, will be too much for the knees right now. I but can't do that. <laughs> the tennis, because I don't want to tear nothing, so I might have to just play a little tennis. It's crazy how you know. quickly that changes where all of a sudden you got to think about activities that won't result in an oh, injury. Yeah. Achilles like, or ACL, I, so I'm man, terrified. Man, you can't put no strain on them. Yeah, me and my friends are talking about hip replacements now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, so you know anyone that has a hip replacement yet, or no? You know, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. How's, how's it looped up? <laughs> hey, who's your hip guy, man? I need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a